We've been utterly lied to about our history and our origins through scientism. And um, our timeline is completely messed up. We have no idea who we are or when we are. And we don't we barely even understand where we are, considering all the deceptions around you know, the heliocentric model and the rest. Well, the real danger is the fact that we are heading toward a post-human apocalypse. There may be a connection between modern-day abductions and the ancient tale of the Nephilim. If we don't understand the Genesis 3.15 narrative, the Messiah will crush your head, you will bruise his heel. That is the gateway to the entire rest of the biblical prophetic narrative. Pergamum. They're in the city where Satan's throne is. Satan is the prince of Rome. The prince of Rome is Jupiter. The prince of Rome is Zeus. Because Satan is Zeus. The end game, which is Armageddon, is going to be the emergence of a new golden age in which the gods walk openly among mankind as they did in the world before the flood of Noah. And there's no stopping it. It will happen. Welcome, everyone. Uh, you're now listening to the Question, the Narrative podcast. And this evening, we have a very special guest with us, Paul from Understanding Conspiracy on YouTube. And if you guys haven't heard about him, you, you need to go check him out, subscribe to his channel. Uh, he's doing a lot of good work over there. So what's up, Paul? How you doing? I'm, I'm pretty good, thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem. So I, I first came across you probably about a month ago, and I'm not going to lie, ever since I saw that video about, uh, you said, if, if, if the millennial reign already happened, then who are we? You know what I'm saying? And mm -hmm. I, I, once I saw that video, it just kind of, it's pretty honest, ruined my life ever since in a good way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sorry about that. Oh, no, it's, it's, it's great, man. It's just, uh, it's crazy too, because, you know, a lot of people, they, they see that just as I did and I almost scrolled over it, but then it just kind of caught my curiosity because, uh, a lot of people, when they when they say that that the millennial reign had already happened, it just triggers something into in in people. And like how you said, you didn't really grow up in the church, and you you don't know the quote unquote rules. <laughs> and so, no, uh, no, yeah. So I mean, it was it was a very very thought provoking video, and you said something in there that that really just caught my attention. And you said that we don't know when we are, and I just had to stop and think about that for for a minute or two, and and that was just a very profound statement, and. I don't know if, if if you'd like to touch in a little bit on what what your findings have been that would be great just as far as like the timeline and and where where are we when are we <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well well this is this is the thing you know when when you got in touch with me and you you were saying you know i, I want you to come on and talk about the the millennial reign stuff i was uh, a bit set back because it's kind of i'm i'm the guy who's known for talking about the nephilim looking like clowns <laughs> exactly <laughs> that's my thing and um to somehow now be the guy who's talking about this particular topic it's uh i don't want to do it a disservice um but i i guess i want to preface everything i'm about to say with i'm not the first person to come up with this you know all credit where credit's due there are better people than me out there who have gone into this for years you know and uh, a lot of what you know a lot of what i've discovered myself is off the back of other people's works really um and i've got my own theories and ideas along the way and people just seem to like listening to me ramble on about it <laughs> for some reason. So, you know, I'm, I'm again, I'm happy to do that with you guys today, but, um, awesome. Or, or for me, you know, I've been in the conspiracy game for, for over a decade. You know, I've been doing this for a long time and it's, it's, I've been tracking the subjects as they come and go throughout the years and how the conspiracy culture and the movement of truthers, you know, follows these trends and, and concepts and ideas and I've kind of spent years trying to create a holistic image of the of the truth of culture to understand the conspiracy. You know, that's kind of the name of my channel. Um, so, you know, throughout the years, I, 
I've kind of deep dived into every topic imaginable and try to create a bigger picture. So, so what is going on exactly? You know, what is the conspiracy? How can we condense it into something like an elevator pitch? Let's say, how can we best explain this to other people who may not know it's happening? And um, when the the trends I basically saw over the last decade, it seems like the movement went from exposing government corruption initially and people questioning narratives, obviously off the back of something like nine eleven. Right. People people realizing the monetary control, the banking system control, the medical control, the media control, all the worldly stuff it starts with initially, you know, and then things started to get started to get spiritual <laughs> over maybe the last 12, uh, 12 years. And there's always been this large contingent of maybe new age style truth as people talking about frequency and consciousness and, um, you know, psychedelic drugs, the pineal gland type of stuff, sacred geometry. So people have always been questioning the validity of reality itself, you know, and from that trend, you know, we, we saw it slowly evolve into people talking about the flat earth movement. Right. And and this came not long after the end of the world phenomena in 2012. You know, everyone thought the world was going to end because the Mayan calendar was coming to an end. And I think that really sparked people questioning their lives in a big way, because a lot of people were really scared that the world was going to end and they were about to die. You know? And I think that gets the ball rolling in a lot of people's minds to start going towards more spiritual concepts. And that's where we saw the rise of these um, big, big ideas the flat earth being the first of them. And and then from that, you know, from the 2012 period to the 2015 period and, and maybe a little bit before flat earth was big, you know, alternative cosmology was huge. And then the Mandela effect turned up in around 2014 to about 2016. It was, that was huge. That was the next big thing everybody was talking about. Right. And people were starting to question reality in a, in a whole new way. And they were realizing things just keep changing. Nothing's consistent. We don't know what is or isn't history. We, we don't know if our memories are fooling us or if things are being... You know. And again, I'm not, we're not here to get into that today, but I think that also got people <laughs> thinking that something's not right. Something is not right with our memories or our history. We're way off, you know. Um, and then from the Mandela effect that kind of dissipated into like a niche subject for a lot of people. And and then new things started to rise up like no forests on flat earth, which was showing that the earth seems to be utterly destroyed. What we think is a beautiful planet, you know, or, or you know, and I shouldn't use that word planet. I know that's going to piss a lot of people <laughs> off, but uh, you know, <laughs> what people think is a beautiful uh, creation, a thing, uh, whatever it is, an enclosed system or, or a thing floating in space, whatever. But um, what people consider the creation to this beautiful, perfect thing is actually a wasteland that's been absolutely mined to the core. And we're living on the husk of its remains. You know, it's not this beautiful thing. And, you know, the trees we see everywhere, the forests are practically moss in, to com in comparison to what used to be there, you know. And I think that got people thinking about, again, history seems to be a lie. What, something's not right, you know. And there's always been the Anunnaki people, you know, that... Um, believe that we are a slave class created by an alien force that appears every now and then and um, people then started to get into the whole mud flood thing after that theory started to pop up and then tartaria suddenly became the next big topic didn't it and yeah yeah and then everyone was into okay so history really is a lie and that was obviously based on a lot of the work of antelo fomenko the russian mathematician and artist who came up with this new chronology series where he was trying to explain you know that it seems like a lot of history is just contrived and condensed down to remove a thousand years worth of history that happened or to make it seem like a thousand years worth of history has been inserted that doesn't really exist to lengthen the amount of time that's actually been around. And the way he does that is he goes through these Eastern and Western narratives of, of um, great armies rising and great empires rising and falling and he realizes they're identical but just with different names throughout right. the mainstream historical narrative and what he's trying to say is this this particular culture over here that r rose to prominence and then fell in let's say 400 a.d is the same culture that is described in 1400 a.d that rose and fell but we've been told they're two different ones so someone's been lying here someone's been making stuff up and confusing matters to the point where you know he makes this fantastic compelling case that yeah well, we have no idea when we are really you know and we can the chronology is way off and history has just been written by the winners basically so you know all these things i, I kind of watched throughout the years and 
I've never been scared to get deep into each one you know, with each <laughs> passing topic. And the Tartaria stuff never quite sat right with me because it's got quite a, a heavy Gnostic contingent behind it. Um, quite a, a heavy, it's all about the great reset. There's no hope. Everything's about to end. And this world is a prison planet type attitude, you know, and the controllers have full control over everything type of thing. Um, but something was never never quite rang right with it for me. Um, although I could see, yes, there's evidences for a shared global architectural style, which doesn't make sense because the narratives we're told about most of these buildings just, just don't work. They don't work. They cannot have been built in the time frames they said they were built. Um, and some crazy stories come up that a lot of these buildings were burnt down, then rebuilt. <laughs> and this kind of... And the, the supposed technology these people would have been working with, it, none of it just added up to me. So I could see that was true, but I just didn't I didn't quite understand how it could. Right. The whole great, the whole repeated reset thing just threw me off a bit. It's kind of, I don't, I feel like we're giving too much credit to this ancient Tartarian empire or whatever that means, you know, and, then, mm -hmm. and we have, we have the history of the Tartars and we know they were kind of isolated into mainly Siberia, Mongolia region and Russia, you know, there's no evidence that they were a global empire. Again, I shouldn't use that word, a worldwide empire, you know, um, so something was off about it, but I knew, yeah, okay, there's clear evidences. History is wrong. We're, we are way off. And, and like many people in the conspiracy culture throughout this decade, I too have been keeping a close eye on the signs of the times. And most of Christian conspiracy and even just mainstream Christian uh, culture in general, you know, never mind the conspiracy world, has had their eyes on the future coming of Christ. You know, and we're looking for signs of tribulation to come to pass, aren't we? And uh, the signs of the times, you know, we're keeping our eyes on the, on world events, looking for the mark of the beast and the false prophets and all these type of things. And that's predominantly what most people are focused on in the conspiracy culture when it comes to Christian conspiracy and, and wider conspiracy. Who is going to be the Antichrist? What is the mark of the beast? You know, um, it, are, are, the, are the signs in the heavens showing, proving that, uh, you know, we're in Revelations 13, for example, and is there's the moon at the woman's feet in Virgo and therefore we were foretold this stuff and people are just setting dates every month and every year this is the end Jesus is coming in this year you know and it's been like that for a long time and I've always seen many antichrists come and go I've seen many mark of the beasts come and go you know I've seen many end times um, pouring of the vials thing come and go you know and and none of it as I'm a Christian myself, you know, don't get me wrong. So that's me. I've been looking and I've been on board with that for a while, this futurist mindset. But then when this video started to, to appear, talking about the millennial reign of Christ, I, I, my ears perked up because I realized I didn't really know anything about that. I've no, I never really heard of them. No one ever talks about the millennial reign of Christ. I'd, I had read it in Revelation, but I never really registered it if you get what i mean because it was just not on my radar as something that was important or it's something that's way in the future that i will probably never see type of attitude and i especially didn't really know about the uh the little season you know that this this uh this time after the millennial reign where the devil would be give be given a short period to take over everything once more just as he did before tribulation began and before jesus came and established his his millennial reign but then when I heard this video by somebody called um, Exploring Tartaria, she right. mapped out this concept, you know, which blew my mind. And I'm sure everyone who's been in this subject now has seen these videos, you know, that that she, she mapped it out perfectly and explained how we can see remnants all over the earth of what people call Tartarian architecture. It seems like it actually, iconography-wise, mainly revolves around saints and Jesus predominantly, and she put forth the idea of, is it possible we're actually in the little season and uh, the millennial reign of Christ has already happened and all of our history in the modern day, the past 200, 300, 500 years, however long you want to say it's been since the little season started, has been utterly rewritten and our past has just been covered up to what truly happened and um, we are not waiting for the second coming of Christ that's already happened. The millennial kingdom has already been established in a physical sense on earth. It came in the clouds down with him. Um, he's already resurrected the saints, you know, and the rest of the dead. 
get resurrected after the thousand years and um we can i'll let you speak for me we can get we can jump off from what i just said there and speculate on what that means to say the rest of that have um resurrected but that's basically uh, how i got into it that was my entrance point into this particular theory but i sat on it for years you know because that video came out years ago and i've just i've just been taking it all in for years watching all the videos on this this take to explain the tartarian angle or what the what's the christian angle because I, I believe the truth is there in the biblical narrative you know that's where i stand but i'll admit i've never been able to square a lot of things up until this theory a lot of things just didn't make sense with the christian perspective until this happened you know and I always knew there was something off about the futurist viewpoint that we're always waiting for Jesus to return and, and establish his kingdom. You know, the tribulation is about to begin. That never sat right with me. It was just a, a feeling, a gut feeling, you know, there's something off about it. So when this, this theory turned up, it changed things. Absolutely. And, uh, I'll stop there. I'll let you guys speak. No. Yeah. 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 That that's awesome, man. And uh, Shane and I, we, we dug into this a couple of weeks ago and, you know, the whole futurist theory thing and the third temple. And we actually dug into the 70 week prophecy of Daniel. And so the church today as a whole uh, say that that there is a pause in the 69th week and this pause can be 2000 years. So we're waiting on that last week to come to fulfillment. Right. But mm the the whole thing with the prophecy of daniel is at the time he was prophesying that there wasn't even a second temple that was built yet and so a lot of people either by deception or ignorance are saying well that's prophecy of the third temple right. but the, mm. but the thing is is that the second temple hadn't even been built yet and at the cutting off of messiah on the 69th week he he literally caused the sacrifices and the oblations to cease and so they're they're wanting to recreate that in a sense where we have to make another temple so that the sacrifices can start up again in order for the sacrifices to then stop again which doesn't make any sense because it has already been stopped for well i mean 2000 years but i mean it might be a lot less from what we're what we're speculating right hmm right <clears throat> no absolutely i mean this is what i mean there's there's how they can kind of jam two thousand years into the biblical narrative it, you have to do a lot of mental gymnastics to make that to square that and make that work you know yeah. i i believe jesus at his word and i i think when he said you know i'm coming back immediately yeah. um you know the time is at hand i believe that and I believe he was talking to the people of that time, not to a future generation, us, you know. Um, and this is what I mean. It always felt a bit snake oily when people were preaching this futurist doctrine to me. Mm. There was something off about it. And and I, and I didn't know what to do or how to question it because, you know, I Jesus saved me personally. You know, I, I know he's real and I, my faith is in him and I know it's the truth, but something about this this mainstream doctrine which everybody believes in christendom just didn't at the yeah. back of my mind it was always itching like there's something off here there's something off you know and then when, when this theory came around and like i said i don't know the rules of engagement because i wasn't raised in a church and i was saved in 2014 i'm, I'm 30 now you know i'm 31 now should i say i'm getting older um <laughs> and I, I still aren't i'm still not a member of any church because every time i tried they just I'm not trying to disparage them, but they're just not thinking about these things. Right. And it's not enough for me. It's just not enough for me. Okay. I'm, and I'm not looking to join these churches and cause strife and, and be a problem for anybody. So I think it's probably best I just stay out of it with my own ideas and thoughts. You know, it's that type of thing. Um, but again, I, I, I suppose when I started talking about these things on my channel, I was naive in thinking that, you know, most Christians would understand what I was talking about. They would know about the little season and the millennial reign type of stuff, you know. So I wasn't, I wasn't aware for the backlash I was going to, I was about to receive, or even just speculating about the possibility of this being a, a thing. And I guess that's the difference between a conspiracy theorist Christian and a normal church going Christian. You know, <laughs> it's just not on their radar, is it? And um, I mean, I, I I've made a document, you know, and I've been I've been compiling quotes that kind of show that yes, you know 
the Bible makes it clear, like unequivocally clear, that Jesus was saying it was going to happen immediately, not long after his death and resurrection. Mm-hmm. You know, and after his, uh, after the transfiguration, he was coming back quickly. You know, he wasn't coming back in two thousand years. So let's just I'll just get the document up and let's just uh, reel off a few quotes, you know, and a few talking points based on this. But um, sure. It says, you know, Jesus will come soon, quote. So we have Matthew 16, 28. Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, there will be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. You know, I mean, people could say, oh, we know he, he was talking about, you know, people will see him resurrect from the dead. That's not right. what it says. It says they will see him coming in his kingdom. Yeah. That's not him raising from the dead. That's something else, you know. Mark 9, 1. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that there be some that stand here which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God come with power. So they're talking about the kingdom of God here, a kingdom of some kind, appearing to them in some way. And then people speculate, he was being metaphorical. He's just talking about you know, the power of Jesus, Jesus's energy suddenly taking over the world or something like that. That's basically what they may talk about, especially the amillennialists who say, you know, the millennial reign's already happening and he's ruling from heaven with, with his father. You know, he's, he's, it was never a physical kingdom, people always say. And again, I would argue that's not what it says. You know, he's talking about people will see the kingdom of God come with power. They will see it. They won't feel it in in the warm and fuzzies in their heart. They, you know, <laughs> they will see it. <laughs> like uh, uh, we have Luke nine twenty seven. You know, but I tell you of a truth: there will be some standing here who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. Pretty straightforward language, you know. People right here in front of me right now will not die before they see me come back with a kingdom. You know, I mean that's pretty black and white language you know uh, luke 2 26 and it was revealed unto him by the holy ghost that he should not see death before he has seen the lord's christ matthew 10 23 but when they persecute you in this city flee into another for verily i say unto you ye shall not have gone over the cities of israel till the son of man become now you can speculate on where the true israel is yeah, um, I wanted to get into that a little you bit know, too. But, uh, <laughs> let, let's just let's just say, you know, for this for the sake of um, the normies out there who are in this <laughs> idea of Christianity that the Middle East is is where it is. The, the Israel we call Israel today is the Israel of the, of the Bible. You know, it's not very big, is it? No, there's not many cities they can flee to <clears throat> <laughs> before he turns up. You know, um, Romans thirteen eleven through thirteen, and that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. It's coming. It, the, it, there's an urgency behind the language in most of these books written by the apostles, you know, and in Revelation. And um, First Peter 4, 7, But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. And people, th- people think they're talking to us you know, 2,000 years later, that's not what's happening. He's talking to people right next to him. Yeah. he's these are, they, they are writing letters to churches, to people who are waiting for him to cut for Jesus to return. And Peter's telling them, be sober, you guys, who I'm writing this letter to right now in the specific time period. We know I'm watching to prayer because the end of all things is at hand. It's about to happen. Not 2,000 years later. Right. You know. And again, you know, I've got more repeat quotes here, but uh, let me see. Uh, you know, Jesus repeated himself over and over again in the Revelation to John, you know, the book of Revelation. And in the start and the end, so in the beginning of Revelation, Revelations 1 1, things which must shortly come to pass. Mm, yeah. That's not talking about 2,000 years later when this was written on the island of Patmos, you know. And you can speculate when, 70 AD, some people say 98, 96 AD, but um, I'm, I'm not going to trust any timestamp dates in any of these things right now, to be honest, because everything's up in the air as far as I'm concerned. But uh, when it was written, 
he said in the very first line of Revelations, things which must shortly come to pass. Mm -hmm. You know, Revelations 1 3, the time is at hand. Revelations 1 7, behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. Now that's a big one. Right. The people who pierced him will see him come in the clouds physically on earth with their own eyes. They will see him come back with his kingdom. <laughs> you know, and those who actually crucified him will live long enough to see him come back. That's that's the words of Jesus Christ himself. You know, I, I can't make him a liar just because I want to believe that I get to be in the millennial kingdom with him or something or, you know, and, and, and don't get me wrong. Not everybody has that attitude. Not everybody is like upset because they don't get to rule for a thousand years with him or live during this time of peace. Right. And it's not fair to plaster everybody who has the futurist belief that that's what they want and why they're upset to have it taken away. It's not, you know, some people have just been in that world for so long. They haven't even comprehended that there is an alternative way of viewing it. So it's a shock to the system. It's just a shock, you know, um, if you've done one thing your entire life and you have, you've done so many works and based your life surrounding this idea that you're living during the time where Jesus is about to return, it can, it can be shocking to, to find out that maybe you've been lied to and that's not the case, you know, that's been a cover up. Um, there's some examples here of why we're not in tribulation. I got this. I got this quote from somebody who posted it onto a comment, and I thought it was really insightful. So I'll just read it to you, and it's it's a basic explanation. Um, so you know, the current nation state of Israel, which was established in 1948, is not of God because the land promises made to Abram and the fathers were for, already fulfilled a very long time ago. This is recorded in the Old Testament. We see in Deuteronomy 1:8:21. 11 24 joshua 21 43 through 45 joshua 23 14 and jeremiah 32 23 and uh, nehemiah 9 7 through 8 uh, king david and solomon were in possession of the whole land up into the up to the river euphrates as promised to abraham in genesis 15 18 this is recorded in two second samuel 8 3 1 first kings 4 21 24 2 and chronicles 9 26 so the lands have already been occupied and the, the promise has already been fulfilled so this new nation state of israel we call today is not a fulfillment of a prophecy that's it's already been fulfilled and done and dusted and it's over with you know israel's continued occupation of the land depended on their obedience to god and it was because of their national sins that they lost it and that's recorded again in deuteronomy and joshua mm. you know, the jews were restored to the land after a 70-year babylonian captivity as promised by God in Daniel 9 2, but lost it again after rejecting their Messiah, Jesus, when wow. Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD. Mm -hmm. So they've already you already got the lands back and then lost it again. <laughs> Repeatedly, it's done. It's there's no promise of another of a new is no, we're not in that time period. It's already happened. You know, so, so people thought that was a you know that that global event, sorry, that world event of Israel being established was prophecy being fulfilled. And we saw not long after that the revival of the futurist doctrine in the Jesus movement in the 60s and the 70s, you know. And a lot of people think that was mainly a counter reaction to the counterculture of the hippie movement of the 60s and 70s. It was like a, a Christian counter movement to the the new age movement that was rising up in rebellion. But you realize, you know, in true controlled opposition fashion. Even though the doctrine is sound, if, you know, because they're talking about Jesus Christ being who he said he was and all that type of thing, it's perfectly sound as long as we are pre-tribulation. And that's the thing that they purported the most in the 60s. They purported that, you know, we can see Israel as a nation state has been created. Therefore, it's pre-millennialism all the way to the end. Jesus is about to return, you know, and that became the established doctrine mm -hmm. of the modern world up until now. And... It's sneaky. They, they kind of sneaked it in through the back door. Now, obviously, premillennialism has always been the basic thought process. People have said so-called, but we don't know how far back our history actually goes and how much is true. People point to the Nicene um, Creed, don't they? The Nicene Creed, where it's, it's written down by uh, you know um, Constantine, try to normalize the belief system, shall we say, of Christendom, and he ordered that this early church council in, like, I think it was 340, was it? I may be getting the date wrong there. But they, they created this this creed, didn't they? And 
it's all pretty straightforward Trinitarian Christianity, you know, up until the end where it says the Catholic Church is supreme over everything and we wait for his return. You know, and people say premillennialism has always been the case since the early church fathers. Therefore, if you say anything else, you're a heretic. You know, but but I don't believe that has always been the case. I'm not 100 percent certain that was really written in 341, as they say, because history has been obscured and stretched and twisted to no end. And it's possible he did appear not long after they wrote that. So it's still fulfilled and done. So they weren't lying, you know, and it's already done. Um, I mean, no, Hadley, the Unexpected Cosmology, who I'm, I'm going to be talking to on um, on Tuesday on my own channel, he's made a very good case that historically speaking, it seems like tribulation events did occur in 541, you know. But obviously what we call 541 may actually be 50 AD or 70 AD, and we've just labelled it wrong with the wrong date because the people that wrote the histories have lied to us, you know. So we, we we don't know exactly how to piece the time puzzles together to make a coherent chronology necessarily, but this revival, we'll call it, of premillennialism in the 60s certainly solidified in the modern age that, yeah, that we are about to have tribulation happen again in the minds of people. And I, I don't think it always was the case. I really, I think a lot of people coming out of the millennial kingdom, if it's true, you know, that it's already happened. I think there was a battle for a long time to make sure premillennialism becomes a prominent thought again. So I think, you know, there's evidences that people have shown that um, getting into who are we exactly, if this is the little season, you know, there's evidences to say that people have um, maybe survived through the millennial kingdom. People have lived through his reign. And only the saints, the the already resurrected, perfected humans who lived for a thousand years and, and didn't die, got to go with him to the beloved city, the camp of saints, shall we say, before handing it over to Satan for his little season. But that means there were still people around who may not have gone with him. Maybe it's possible. Some people just didn't want to leave their homes. It's possible because humans have always been rebellious. People didn't want to go with him, you know, and they wanted to stay where they were. Uh, well, so be it. But Jesus' enemies also lived through the millennial reign, I believe. And they were forced to live through his reign because they had extended life during this time, you know, because everything was perfected and and, and beyond nor normality, as we would call it today. And uh, I think those people, once he cleared off, very quickly sided with Satan and took it upon themselves to eradicate history and keep the people who remember the millennial reign in line. And this is where we find insane asylums being everywhere during the early 1800s, the late 1700s, just propping up all over the place. And, you know, yeah. religious, religious further and delusion was, was one of the biggest reasons people were locked up in these things. And it seems likely the, the controllers who are survivors of the millennial reign locked up all the other survivors of the millennial reign who still believed in Jesus and knew that he had already reigned. So there's been a dark, concerted cover-up effort, it seems. All the, all the research just keeps bringing more and more of this dark, disgusting history up, you know, that what we call secret societies today, you know, the conspiracy culture is obsessed with Freemasons and secret societies, you know, and they control everything. Well, these are the original people immediately after the millennial reign ended when Satan took over who controlled everything. They took control of everything. They were the foot soldiers of the little season and they mm -hmm. claimed ownership of all the free masonry everywhere, <laughs> you know, and they're the ones who took control of the orphans. The odd fellows specifically were the ones who took it upon themselves to look after all the orphans, orphans of who exactly? Why were there so many orphans everywhere? You know, why was it, but is it possible the children of the millennial kingdom parents who were all locked away in insane asylums just needed putting somewhere and relocating and moving and filling up these empty cities that were left behind? There's so much speculation you can go through here, but uh, yeah. mark my words, Jesus said himself he was coming immediately. The 2000 year thing is a lie. It's, it just is. And again, I don't have all the answers. This is, I, I can't come to you guys today and say I've got it all mapped out perfectly. Uh, it's just clear we've been lied to and it's not a big stretch for me to consider this angle considering I've been swimming in every other topic for so long. It, it seems it's easy, you know, but uh, I'll let you guys talk. Sorry, I, I go on. I do ramble. No, no, no. Yeah, that's 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 why we got you here, man. But OK, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I, I had heard when you were talking with uh, Toad, Toad House or something like that. 
And he was talking about the futurist doctrine too, and how it's it's a little concerning to him as well. How how it's so pushed and so out in the open this futuristic doctrine whereas it seems like like satan and the enemy is okay with that message you know what i'm saying like yeah. it's just even the pre like a pre-trib rapture stuff it's in the hollywood movies and stuff and so if, if we we know in in today's society that if they don't want you to know a certain thing that it's going to be squashed it's going to be uh buried you know even just like the history stuff that we're talking about now it's just it's not going to be easy to find that kind of information but all all of this futurist stuff it's just out in the open it's broadcast on all the tvs and it seems Mm. like satan is okay with that message exactly that's 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 another thing people say you know where's the evidence that he's already come you know where's the historical evidence and i would say well actually there is plenty of historical evidence you by your standards you just deem it irrelevant and so there is that first of all but also i don't believe anything gets shown in the mainstream media unless it's allowed to be there whatever can go under that black box in the corner of your room is a part of the system's control mechanism and you know it's and it's the thing people believe christendom is strong it's growing there's churches mm. everywhere it's one of the fastest growing religions you know next to islam shall we say <laughs> but it's uh it's one of those people believe we live in a day you know where there's revivals all the time and there's there's new um, protestant denominations rising up everywhere you know and and the word of god has spread to everyone in the nation there's there's only you know we're we're, we're, we're reaching everybody now and uh, and it, this is how it said it would be. You know, information would go to and fro. You know, everyone would run to and fro, and information would would grow in the times before Jesus returned. And everyone, everyone believes, you know, Christendom is powerful and strong and growing, and we'll we'll stick it to those evil controllers and evil in the world. And you know, Jesus will establish his kingdom, and there'll be peace forever and ever and ever, and everyone will be resurrected in holy light bodies, and all the evil people will burn in hell. You know, and never, but but people do believe, like. This is the prominent thought. This is what's preached by the mega churches. You know what I mean. And this is what's preached um, everywhere. That yeah, Jesus is about to return, and we're about to go through tribulation, and good will win in the end. That type of attitude. And don't get me wrong. I mean, that is tr- true. But the deception is in where are we in the timeline? You know, are we really waiting for a Jesus to turn up um, and establish a kingdom, or are we waiting for final great white throne judgment at the end of time? You know, and if <laughs> this is this is one of these niggling what you've brought up there, and what Theron, that's his name, who runs the channel with his wife Bethany. That's right. Um, Homestead Seven, sorry, Toad House Seven Homestead. Now, yeah. what he said, I agree, and I brought it up myself. You know, the fact that the mainstream a loud view is that message that jesus is about to return should raise your eyebrows immediately okay Mm. it's why is it allowed to be said if it's such a bad thing and and satan hates it so much and he owns all the media why would he allow that to be said on tv you know what i mean and it's a subtle deception it's very subtle because it makes christianity seem powerful and strong and growing and, and brilliant and the Christians who are a part of it are, you know, new new apostles. You know what I mean, who are spreading the gospel and the word and and casting demons out of people, and everything's wonderful and great, you know. But that's that's exactly where Satan would want you to be, isn't it? He would want you to believe that you know it all and everything's perfect and everything's going great for you, you know. But just by simply confusing where you are in time, that can, mm. that can change everything. And he's, mm. and yeah, you can go ahead. And preach the coming of the new savior, the coming of the savior is, is nine is about to happen as much as you want, because that's great for him, because he's going to turn up and be that savior for you. He's going to put himself in that position. He's going to be as the most high himself. You're all waiting for Jesus to return. So Satan, Lucifer can put on a pretty good show for you. They can come as an angel of light, you know, <laughs> and people are waiting for that, you know, and it's like, yeah, sure. People, there, there might be an antichrist that comes, you know, a false beast system will rise a new world order and we'll defeat it and then jesus will come and and judge everybody but if we're already past all of that the thing we're about to see that's going to call itself jesus is not jesus we have to remember that it because he's not going to come to establish a kingdom the last time he's going to bring fire from heaven and then it's everything is dead and it's immediate judgment it's something else you know um an army needs to be raised first and uh 
this it kind of makes sense of a lot of other conspiracy theories and this is why i was attracted to it so much so for example the alien phenomena that we see so much you know the the ufo the coming the coming uh, ufo invasion that's been leaked forever you know through military and they're always hinting at it through predictive programming movies that uh, there's going to be an alien invasion and all of humanity is going to come together to fight this this common enemy you know this idea this reagan speech all over again you know they've been they've been prepping us through the media for so long about an alien invasion of some kind you know Werner von braun talking about the final stage is an alien fake alien invasion you know, it's all it's all a lie. You know, it's all going to be this contrived story that these evil controllers are going to come up with. Um, and then we're told, you know, Christ will return. So I don't know. I don't know where it fits into the biblical narrative. I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure the Bible doesn't talk about aliens turn up, turning up anywhere. You know? <laughs> but, but for some reason, a lot of Christian conspiracy theorists are obsessed with this idea, too, and are on it and saying, oh, it's it's fallen angels, it's demons. And it's kind of well, the, that narrative really isn't anywhere exactly you know especially not pre-tribulation that there's going to be aliens turning up in flying saucers or something and um, you know we got project blue beam on the side of all this we got the chemtrails that people say are nanoparticles which are going to be used with project blue beam to project a holographic invasion in the sky um loads of loads of things are coming are building towards this spectacle that's about to be created and it's going to be completely contrived and fake isn't it you know um well that would make sense if that's about to happen if we're in the millennials, if we're in the post millennial season, and this is a little season because Satan needs to gather an army to make war with the camp of saints. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So how's he going to do that? How's he going to convince pretty much everybody whose number is of the sands of the, you know, the, the sands of the sea, a billion man army all coming together to surround something we'll call it the beloved city, you know, which is, as it says in the Bible, to make war with the camp of saints. How, how is he going to do that? Well, if everyone believes aliens have invaded and they're in the North Pole, let's say, or wherever they're going to be, you know, it's floating giant thing in the sky. That's like a, like a floating city, shall we say, of some kind, the mothership, shall we call it? You know, if you can convince that they they come here to attack and take us down, let's go make war with it. And then you, you just, you've just gathered Gog and Magog from the four corners of the earth to surround the beloved city, haven't you? And we all believe we're fighting against evil, oppressive aliens who have come to uh, control us and take over and or whatever nefarious thing we've been brainwashed with. So it kind of, things start to make sense when you start viewing them in this new perspective, this new paradigm. You know, that's all these conspiracy theories ever are. They're a paradigm shift each time, you know. And I think this is like, this feels like a final shift, a final paradigm, a final lens to view it all through. To How can we make sense of all these agendas everywhere we see? What's the point of it all? This is a question I get all the time as a conspiracy theorist. Why would they do this? Why would they try to control us so much? You know, what, what's the end goal here? What's the point? Why would they go to so much effort? And it's kind of what well, the little season narrative explains this. The time is short. Mm -hmm. It's a short season. And I don't know how long a little season is, how long's a piece of string. You know what I mean? I think it's as long as it takes to get, <laughs> to get, to get that army, to get that army together. But he, he's, yeah. he's got a job to do the devil. At the end of the day, God is in control, you know? And again, I, these are, these are things, again, I don't have the answers to, but I, I made a video saying, you know, we have to rethink everything now. We've spent the best part of two decades in the truther movement aiming at the wrong goal <laughs> looking at the shadows on the wall you know we've been we've been we've not been really paying attention to the right things we've been taken for a ride if this millennial kingdom thing is true you know if this little season thing is true we've been thinking we're exposing the evil and really all we're doing is feeding it do you get what i mean we're actually helping by getting everybody riled up waiting for a a you know an alien invasion or a false savior or the antichrist to turn up or whatever they want to say you know what i mean and it, I, I do believe they're going to put on a good show for us that's going to look like tribulation evolving aliens and interdimensional beings the nephilim returning as it was in the days of noah all these things human hybrid chimeras appearing once more you know um maybe even things rising out of the sea or something i don't know they're going to do something they're going to make it look pretty convincing 
you know, and they're going to put, they're going to make a convincing mark of the beast. And this is what I'm saying. I'm not saying just because the millennial season has come and gone that we no longer have to be wary of coming deceptions and events. Things are still going to happen. All right. Horrible things are going to happen. Christians are going to be persecuted and beheaded just as they were before. Okay. They're going to make it look like tribulation is happening, but it's all contrived. It's all orchestrated. It's not, it wasn't the real one. It's already happened. Okay, so what comes at the end of it all? When it's not Jesus, how many people are going to lose their faith? Yeah. They were waiting for him to come in the clouds and save them, but he doesn't turn up. It just gets worse. <laughs> okay, I don't know. Then I don't know what happens. I don't know what he's going to you know, it's Some kind of AI transhumanist nightmare hellhole, no doubt, where it's kind of like a, a, a constant torment or something. I don't know. <laughs> like something. <laughs> he's going to establish something. Maybe his own version of his own millennial kingdom is what Satan's aiming for here. So he can be like Jesus, you know. Um, maybe that's what the end goal is. But it's not going to It's not going to look like the tribulation event they were hoping for, the Christians are all waiting for. It's going to be something else which is going to destroy their faith. And maybe then he'll be able to gather that army because everyone will feel betrayed. Maybe I don't know. You know what I mean? I, yeah. I can spec. I'm in the realms of speculation here of how it's all going to pan out. But what I know is, if if the tribulation event has already happened and we're in the little season, we can no longer take things at face value. We can't just look at the stars and think we see the signs unfolding of Revelations 13, for example. Angels are in rebellion. Angels are stars. Why should we trust the signs in heavens anymore? It's like, why should we trust where where they choose to position themselves and where the planets decide to align and be? The planets are wandering stars. They are angels who left their first estate. They shouldn't even be there. You know, so why are people putting so much faith in these signs? Like, it, things are different now. It's it's not the world that it was before tribulation. And um, it, it's it's trippy to think about. <laughs> and all I do is speculate on my channel. Again, I'm not I'm not an expert in 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 this necessarily. Um, I just know a lot about I know a lot of things about a lot of things. You know, I know a little bit about about every topic in the conspiracy. So as me, someone piecing this puzzle together to create a holistic picture, you, you cannot just throw this little season theory out. You really can't. Um, everything's everything's up for debate now. Everything's on the table because we have been hideously lied to from the very beginning. We already know we've been lied to. Why is this such a far stretch for some people? You know, do you have theories? Do you have ideas? Share with me, guys, because I'm I'm not. I'm in for a conversation about this. What do you guys think? Yeah, um, I'm with you, man. With with all this deception and you know the the obvious fake history and all these founded uh, buildings and stuff. I mean, like you said, this 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 Satan short series. I mean, short season theory. It's definitely on the table, and it's definitely biblical. Someone has to be part of that, you know, remnant, the number of whom is like the sand of the sea, mm -hmm. occupying these nations. I mean, somebody, you know what I mean? There's somebody has to be that generation. And it's not too far fetched to think that that could be us, um, mm -hmm. especially with all the deception and the, the, the false narratives that are being fed to us and. Like you said, I, I mean, I, I really like this theory and it makes a lot more sense of the scriptures. And um, especially when you realize, you know, what happened in 70 AD with the destruction of the temple and mm -hmm. Jerusalem and, and all that. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just, you know, really new to this theory. <laughs> I knew before this, though, I knew something was off the timeline. I mean, I could just feel it. You know, when I read the Bible for myself, it just didn't seem to line up with what, you know, my preacher, the preachers were telling us. I mean, I grew up in church my whole life. And of course, he, you know, my pastor preached pre-trib rapture, you know, almost every Sunday. That was the main topic was pre-trib rapture and um, all that. But that mm -hmm. even that just never, never made sense to me either. And then um, I got away from pre-trib rapture and I was like, well, we're going to definitely, according to the scriptures, we'll definitely go through the tribulation and the rapture happens at the second coming. But, um, <clears throat> you know, my whole life, I never even knew about 70 AD or the events that, that took place on that day because we don't got any scripture for it. Why mm -hmm. was the, why did the Bible stop being written, 
you know, after the book of Revelation, why aren't there more books telling us what happened during that time? That's a huge prophecy fulfilled, you know, the destruction of the temple. Jesus said that there wouldn't be one stone left upon another. And that came true exactly as he said. And that was a sign of his imminent return was when the, you know, when the temple was going to be destroyed. He said, you know, don't even look back. Don't come down off the housetop and go in your house and, and get any clothes, just flee. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what, what else happened and what else is being hid from us? It's, it's a really, like I said, this theory just makes a lot of sense to me. Um, obviously I can't mm -hmm. prove it and I'm new to it, but, um, what you're saying makes a lot of sense. It really does. Yeah. Well, we're, we're trying. We're trying our best to create what we can with what we have. This is right. this is all we can do, really. I, mm -hmm. I tried to explain it last night. You know, this is one of those, um, a lot like, let's say, the flat Earth theory. It's one yeah. of those things where all of history and science is telling us it's a ball, but our eyes and our perceptions and our sense experience is telling us otherwise. Yeah, isn't it? This is what this kind of theory is. All of our history books are telling us. It hasn't come yet. But what our eyes can see and the evidences that are clear to us by the way things are going down and what's left on the earth that we can actually see with our own eyes, it's telling us it did happen. Melted buildings everywhere. Signs of absolute destruction everywhere. Land utterly decimated by electricity everywhere. You know, no, barely any old trees. Yes, some old trees do exist. Sure, not enough. Like something happened, something reset everything. Um, and the only thing that biblically can square that is tribulation. You know, right. from the evidences we see. You know, and again, um, you know, there's a, there's a great one people keep posting to me um, in the Telegram group. And I, I, it might take me a while to find it now if I did try. If anyone is listening who knows what I'm talking about and wants to post it in the Telegram group right now, that would be great. But it's basically evidences that all these buildings, which uh, prophecy, apparently tribulation prophet, prophecy requires to still be in existence, don't exist anymore. Mm. And there's evidences that most of these places in the Middle East that, you know, tribulation was talking about that, you know, you'll see this happen here and that happened there. Well, those places are already destroyed. There's yeah. nothing left. So how can prophecy come true and be tribulation come to pass if these places no longer exist and are just rubble? You know, how is that possible? Like, um, yeah, history tell they're trying to tell us one thing, but our senses are telling us the other. It's self-evident by the things which we can see, you know, and we're always told you can't trust your senses. And uh, I'm, I'm, I don't think that's true. I think that's a lie. <laughs> I'm going to trust my senses on this one. Um, something's off. And the, right. evi the evidence is there. If you look, I mean, uh, this, this is another, th this is what's shocking about this concept as well. You know, the buildings, these beautiful buildings everywhere that don't seem to make sense when we were told they were built. Um, the people really couldn't have built them the way they said it on such a scale and in such number with such uniform style across every continent. It just doesn't make sense. The history is a lie. But these are buildings I've walked past my entire life, even in my own, in my own home, little small town, you know, and then suddenly I'm actually seeing them for the first time because they're on my radar. And they're incredible. And it's mm. these are the type of paradigm paradigm shifting topics we're talking about here. You know, suddenly I, I can't walk through the park, the Victorian park now in my in my city in the UK without seeing it for what it is. It's an incredibly beautiful thing with extremely complex stone bridges, cenotaphs, benches with Egyptian iconography all over them, all completely out of place in cast iron metal steel work. You know what I mean? In ways that just boggle the mind with such intricate details far beyond what was necessary for the time you know and you realize that these are everywhere all over the place and it's kind of who had the time and the manpower to do this well it seems like these things could only only really have been built sure we can do it now but for the times they said no chance you know and it's they must have been built during a time where people had the time to make things beautiful and for the sake of beautiful 
rather than uh, utilitarian, which is what we do today with our buildings. You know, they have to be useful, not beautiful. Um, you, you can see, you can see that there's like this linear uh, digression, not progression. Right. Um, we've gotten worse at things. We've taken short. We take shortcuts now. We don't take the time to make things look good. But there's people in the past did in ways that just just boggle the mind. You, people are really experimental with architecture in the past. You know, during this millennial kin kingdom, let's say, if that's when the architecture did come from, um, and the artwork that was being created, the messages behind it, it, all of it is just screaming something, something else, something next level. And I would, I would always in the past go to these buildings and think, oh, they look really nice and beautiful. But when you look at them through this lens, that's what we're doing at the end of the day. We're putting on a lens here, aren't we, and viewing the world through it. It changes everything. It looks incredible. Everything looks amazing. And you realize what's going on, you know, that we are we are just squatters in a world that didn't belong to us. <laughs> you know, so who who are we exactly then? You know, so, like, what's going on here? Who are we? You know, like I said, are we the remnants of people who survived through the millennial reign and were just their descendants? Or, as it's described in Revelations 20, it says the rest of the dead live not again till the thousand years has ended. Oh, man. Now, is that immediately after the thousand years has ended? Or is that metaphorically for at the end of the thousand years and then at the end of the little season, everybody's resurrected at once for final judgment? I don't think it says that. I think it's telling us the first resurrection involves the martyrs. They will reign with Christ forever, including through his millennial reign. And they will be go to the camp of saints. They will be the saints. They will be in their perfected light bodies. Um, they've got a free pass at judgment. They're done. <laughs> you know what I mean? The judgment's pretty much done. You know what I mean? They they they, they pass the test they're in. Uh, but then the rest of the dead, everybody else is resurrected after the thousand year reign. So there's a second resurrection. A resurrection means physical body. You can't. You know, you're resurrected into into flesh. That's what resurrected is. You know, when when you're in spirit form and in the in heaven with God at the great white throne for judgment, you're not resurrected into a body. You've just been woken up as a spirit form. I guess it's not really a resurrection, is it? You know, um, you know Christ resurrected into a physical body, mm. and that's what he's offering everybody else. The saints got that in the first resurrection. Blessed are the ones who take part in the first resurrection, as it says, you know, because they get to reign with Christ forever. They get to go through his millennial reign and then some. But everybody else, all the rest of the dead who before all of this, throughout all of history, those who never even got a chance to know Christ, you know, who didn't, who never even heard of him before. Well, I believe they get a chance and they get resurrected again. And, and maybe that's us now in the little season. Maybe we are people who have already died. I know people don't like to hear that. I'm not talking about reincarnation here. Right. I'm, talking about, I'm talking about resurrection. The Bible is a book about conquering death and resurrection. Why is it unheard of to consider that God may resurrect the dead in the end time to live through the little season? Because we live in a time now where if you go out of your way, you can find out about Jesus Christ and get saved. Right. You can. Mm -hmm. You can in this world. It may be after his millennial reign, but everybody knows who Christ is. There may be some pockets of the of the world where people don't, but I, th I think the Holy Spirit the Spirit still works and they can still get to know him without the book. Yeah. You know, I think there's there's ways, you know, and um Yeah, what you said about reincarnation, uh to how a lot of people get, you know, iffy about that. But Shane and I were talking about this the other day that in scripture, John the Baptist was actually Elijah. Yeah. I don't know if you ever looked into all that, but yeah, you know, uh, John the Baptist didn't even know he was Elijah. And Jesus said, no, he is. This was Elijah, which was for to come, which is another prophecy because it said Elijah was going to come before the day of the Lord. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, as weird as it sounds, could it, could it be that john uh john the baptist was a reincarnation of elijah i mean i don't know i mean there's a lot of things we don't really understand well it, it just, doesn't he say clearly john is elijah Isn't he that... clearly he clearly <laughs> says it. Yeah. so that's a resurrection no that's the same spirit resurrected and, and, and i can't remember where i saw this but people who saw jesus after his resurrection he didn't look the same did he no 
you know they so, they knew it they knew it was him but but yeah. they just he didn't look the same he was in a different type of body right so it, yeah. from you know this and it happens all the time and people are raised from the dead she didn't jesus raised there were like 10 people from the dead when he was walking you know lazarus being probably the most popular one that people know of but i'm pretty sure he raised people from the dead so people who have died bodies rotting in the tomb resurrected it's possible all things are possible through god yeah. and christ that's that's don't limit him in that respect you know because oh no reincarnation's blasphemous then it's kind of but well, we're not talking about reincarnation. We're not talking about your soul in an endless cycle coming back into the earth repeatedly after every death into a different form based on your karma and how good or bad you were depends on what you get to come back as. That's reincarnation. We're talking about biblical resurrection. You, your essence, your soul comes back in its intended God-created flesh body. That's yeah. different. That's not, that's not reincarnation. That's resurrection at God's appointed time only, not in repeated cycles. So mm -hmm. God has appointed the times. He's laid them out in Revelation. Obviously, Jesus rose people from the dead as examples that of his power. And he even says, Lazarus has died, so I can prove to you as witnesses that I can bring people back from the dead. That's why this has happened. He's making it clear it's all done for an intended purpose. Yeah. You know, you know, that's, it, right. So th it's always explained why these things happen. And in Revelation, it says it's the first resurrection after tribulation those who endured to the end or those who were beheaded for his name's sake are resurrected. Those are the saints. Those are the ones, those are the martyrs, you know, those are the apostles who were killed, you know, to spread the gospel during this early time, just before his immediate return, they get to reign with him forever. That's the first resurrection. And then it says, and then there's a second resurrection after the thousand years or has ended. So the Bible's telling you there are there are resurrections of flesh bodies. And what I'm saying right now is we must be either descendants of those who live through the millennial reign, or we are those resurrected, or the descendants of those who are resurrected. But it's likely our soul or nefesh is one of the many who is waiting to be resurrected that's kind of birthed into this world through our parents, you know, or something like that is happening. And, and it's kind of, is a little season as long as it takes for us all to be resurrected once more, once. And as soon as every spirit or soul has had that second, has taken part in the second resurrection, then the little season's over. Is it, is that what a little season is defined as? I don't know. Um, how long does it take, you know, to get through all these? Um, I, I don't think, it's everybody all at once, maybe. I think it is a case of through birthing, this has happened, maybe. And it's uh, with each, and maybe this is why abortion is such a big thing today. Mm -hmm. mm. It's, it's a way to slow down the process of, uh, of these people who take part in the second resurrection having their chance. <laughs> you know, maybe, uh, maybe that's why the push for that is so, so vigorous today. Um, maybe he's trying to make his short season longer. Maybe that's what all this is all about. I think, I think. I think reality is so much more trippy and, and complicated than we can understand, you know? And yeah. when we, like I said, these agendas at play start to fit when you start considering what the Bible actually says about this time, what people who would live during this time and the people who live during this time, it's not explained clearly, but we are told the second resurrection happens after the millennial reign ends. So we have to speculate on what that means. And, right. uh, that, that's kind of where I settle on that. Um, and it's, it's interesting. You talk about the day of the Lord there earlier, weren't you? And I was just talking about this yesterday. Um, and I, th I think the day of the Lord, from what I'm gathering, I think Shelley at um, No Place Like Home was kind of mentioning this, that the day of the Lord isn't necessarily one event, although there is the big one, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> tribulation. There's many days of the Lord's for multiple civilizations who suffer his wrath. That everyone's day comes when they don't turn from their sin, essentially. Um, but you get descriptions of the days of the Lord, you know, I think, and, then, and a lot of it, it always involves a fire coming down from heaven. Mm -hmm. Could it be that the day of the Lord description in, let's say, Ze Zephaniah or Isaiah, um, which a lot of it's based on, you know what I mean? Um, where, which is it? Uh, I've got it mapped out here on my little thing uh, isaiah 13 9 through to the end of the chapter it's a lot like the description in zaphaniah as well about the day of the lord and what that entails um, but then i wondered 
is the day of the Lord, obviously it's a cyclical event thing, a cyclical destruction through for pockets of locations on earth. I think Sodom and Gomorrah is a good one that people can relate to very quickly. And that involved mm-hmm. a lot of fire coming down from heaven and don't look at it directly. You can't handle it. It's insane. It's the, it's the fire of God, the holy judgment of God. You know what I mean? And I think uh, there may have been many of those moments all over the earth throughout history, but what's described in Revelation is a day of the Lord event. Once the armies have gathered, Gog and Magog, and he takes them to make war with the camp of saints, fire comes down and destroys them all. That's a day of the Lord event. So could the description of the day of the Lord we get in, in, in scripture actually be describing the true end event, not tribulation, like people have equated it to? Should we mm. now start to look at it through that lens instead? Um, and it's a brutal time, you know, but uh, the whole earth will be consumed for he will make a sudden end of all who live on the earth. That's what it says, you know, in Zephaniah when it's describing the day of the Lord. Now, tribulation isn't isn't an end of all who live on earth. People live through tribulation. Right. You know, people are resurrect. People are resurrected through tribulation. But a lot of people equate the day of the Lord to being a description of tribulation. But at the end of this description in Zephaniah, it says the whole earth will be consumed, for he will make a sudden end of all who live on the earth that's the revelation 20 event where fire comes down and ends everything everything's ended full stop end of the tape done story over everyone then in front of the great white throne for judgment it's time you know then and then only then after all the judgment is completed and then things are thrown into the lake of fire is there a new heaven a new earth and a new jerusalem only Mm. then but a lot of people don't see it that way. A lot of people think tribulation happens and then New Jerusalem comes and it's done. Yeah. You know, they th- they've they condensed it into one event when there's a thousand, of possibly 1,500 years between that, <laughs> you know, where there's a little season after the thousand year reign um, and yeah. then Great White Throne Judgment. So I think the Day of the Lord descriptions we see, we need to reinterpret that as well. These visions of Days of the Lord, uh, not only are they talking about cyclical, small cataclysms for certain cultures who blasphemed against god in the most heinous ways and they received his divine judgment i think it's also explaining the final divine judgment at the end of time i think that's the true day of the lord the final day of the lord you know and uh, that's again just something i throw out there which i thought was interesting because you mentioned it Um, yeah yeah that's one thing that we do have is is we do have a sure word and we 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 must go by that if if god's word is is the truth then we need to have that at least on our side, regardless of what history tells us and all this other stuff. Because when I started digging into it a little bit more, I know you had mentioned about uh, the Middle East and and what people are calling Israel today. Hmm. I started looking into what the Bible describes as Mount Zion. And that Mount Zion that's over there in the Middle East, what they call Mount Zion, is just a little hill. Like it's nothing. Like yeah. we got we got bigger hills over here in in Tennessee Mm -hmm. and and it's just it does not fit the description of what the Bible says about Mount Zion and another thing I I started looking at uh, when the Bible speaking about the Garden of Eden and these four rivers that are flowing out of Eden and one of them being the Euphrates River and so in a sense if the Euphrates River what people are calling Euphrates today that river should flow out through Eden according to the Bible, but I don't think that's the case today. So that's another thing that causes red flags. You know what I'm saying? And so I think that not only do we not know where we are on the timeline, but we don't even know if the geological locations where we think we are, are even true as well. Like we, in in America, I mean, I've heard speculations. We we might be living in Egypt from the Bible. You know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. No, I've heard that too. I, I think Alpha Talks has done some great work from that, vitally from uh, Alpha Talks. Um, I, I want to get in touch with him. I, 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 I discovered a, a buried email from him, actually, which he sent me months ago asking to, to connect. Uh, so I need to respond to him. But um, it got buried, and I just didn't realize it was there. So I think you might think I'm ignoring him or I'm mad at him or something. <laughs> I'm not. Like, yeah. If he's listening to this, uh, I'll uh, invite him. We need to get in touch and we'll sort it out and we'll talk about stuff. But um, I, I saw his, he talked to um, uh, 
JT follows JC, uh, which you guys yeah. had on recently, uh, Jason. He was talking to him about this and on Decoding Babylon, and it's just re- got released on Jason's uh, YouTube channel. And he's basically laying out everything, you know, the melted buildings, all the evidences. And he did some great work, which shows that, yeah, no, what they call the Middle East, you know, and where we call Jerusalem and Israel today, that's not the geographical location. Everything actually went down. It seems like, and he he actually has a great explanation. He says, Pangea, this idea of of, uh, of an unseparated landmass that wasn't that long ago. And it's tribulation, which separated everything. Do you get what I mean? And created that makes sense. And um, it's possible, you know, the, the the apostles spread the gospel to every corner of the earth, you know. And he says, you know, the angel went over and pronounced the gospel to everybody before tribulation. You know what I mean? And everybody saw it. Is it possible that it was easy to get to everywhere at one point because everything was connected by land very easily and not separated by vast oceans, the treacherous oceans that would. Mm-hmm take months to traverse <laughs> you know what i mean it's possible they literally just walked everywhere quite easily um and it's possible you know the wilderness described that they wandered in for 40 years you know israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 years after escaping egypt you know what i mean um mm-hmm. and they say you know people argue you like that the, the distance they had to travel didn't take 40 years it should not have taken 40 years <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's not that far. And I think someone was giving an example of a Roman siege where they traveled way further in such a shorter amount of time, you know, during a campaign all the way through Macedonia and through Turkey and everything like that and back all the way back into Greece and to Rome through Italy, you know, and it's kind of like the distance they traveled is like literally 80 times more the distance than Israel had to travel and wander in the desert for, you know what I mean? Um, is it possible they weren't wandering through that land? They were wandering through a vast wilderness, a huge amount of land, and America is a huge amount of vast wilderness with varying forms, you know? And I think I think there's a lot to, to be said for just how much we've been lied to about geographic locations of, of historical events. Absolutely. Like, um, things do not add up at all. And I think Alpha Talks has done a far more work on that than I have, which is brilliant. So I'd recommend people go look to him for the for the for the details. I've given just a not even a great summary. I'm not even happy with the way I've described that because it's because <laughs> it's so detailed. You know, there's so much it to, is. To, to say. It's kind of I can't. I just cannot say it all. I don't want to do it a disservice. So go check out Alpha Talks, work on it all. He talks about floating cities, um, Shangri-La, all the evidences in other cultures that there is this, there was this golden age and this beloved city, this and these people make pilgrimage to and all sorts of things. You know what I mean? He goes into American history and how it's all aligned. It was possibly Egypt, honestly, and and it's wonderful. <laughs> but it's the thing, people are coming together now and kind of piecing the puzzles together. Um, and I've just become a voice among them but i'm by no means the, the guy who should be credited with any of this you know i'm just yeah. a guy who has, has some ideas that's all um, yeah, and like you were saying about piecing the puzzles together it, it's kind of like a progression of things because even this little season wouldn't really make sense if you still believed in like a spinning globe floating in outer space because mm-hmm. you're like well the, the north pole like what that doesn't make any sense but you you see what we're talking about how there might be this massive magnetic mountain there in the center which that might actually be mount zion Mm -hmm. and and so all of that doesn't make sense if you believe in a spinning ball globe and even the alien stuff you were talking about you know as as far as we know you know the nothing gets in or out of that firmament unless unless god allows it to so there's not going to be any alien invasion from outer space like we've all been programmed to believe but it's all it's all in all the movies and a lot of times it's like an inversion the the mothership like you were saying earlier could be new jerusalem descending down and mm-hmm. so it's always it, the mothership in the movies is always the bad guys you know what i mean but it may very well be that that's jesus coming down on on his city mm-hmm. and so just going along with that i know a lot of people uh they even if they are entertaining this this idea they just struggle with the fact that if jesus christ was truly reigning here on this earth for a thousand years how would it even be possible for satan to deceive all the nations again and where 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 is jesus you know is is it just hidden from us as well 
Hmm. Well, uh, again, the, the the main theory is that he is in the North Pole. Um, what, right. we, what we have been told is the North Pole today is just a ever shifting ice sheet that moves constantly, and there's really nothing there, you know. And there's no point in going there; you won't find anything. It's just it's just where you'll find the magnetic North Pole, which moves constantly, and a little red flagpole established somewhere, <laughs> which is the official North Pole, apparently, which you can go and hold hands in a circle around unorganized <laughs> on and approved trips if you want to you know if you have enough money but uh where they say the north pole is and where you can visit isn't it it's not even close um no. it's just where you're allowed to get to commercial wise and again there's two actually two poles there's a magnetic north which is constantly moving and there's a there's a, a stationary north pole which is the true you know the the it's the like exact map map dictated center you know what i mean that's how they call it um but if you look at like um you can get maps that show wind movements in the north pole and, and, and energy movements from solar flares as they call them or whatever you know um the aurora borealis is supposed to be that but again from this new new perspective you've got to understand no it seems like if that's where the beloved city is and where the throne of god resides above in the center of the stationary flat earth above the firmaments then what we're seeing are radiating energy light forms from his throne or perhaps from Jesus himself, who's in the center of the earth, his beloved city, you know. Uh, so these things do need new interpretations for what these phenomena are. But what I find more interesting is that the North Pole is moving. And it's been moving from the north northern lands of America and Canada, the Americas. And now it's moving across and getting closer to Siberia, which is the other yeah, side. Yeah, I saw that video. I saw that video you made on that. That's yeah. very interesting. Yeah. And if it's po- it could be possible, you know, that that is the camp of saints, that it literally is a floating giant city. <laughs> like which is mm-hmm. moving and magnetic north pole is the camp of the saints which we can follow and trace and see where it's been moving to and what is interesting about that and this is again speculation but this is all we can really do but it's described that they will march up the broad expanse of the earth to make mm-hmm. war with the camp of saints okay now the largest expanse of earth we have is siberia and russia um, and that's exactly where it's moving to right now. So that can't just be left out. You know what I mean? That's that, that does actually match up with scripture. And is it possible people will visibly start to see the beloved city move over the land of Earth and will think we're being invaded when they see. So this you think event. it'll be like a like a progressive event? Yeah, so like it's kind of it's kind of drumming everyone up. They, they're showing it on the news and everything like that. Yeah, it's like witnesses can see in, in Siberia, um, reports are coming in that there's a there's a spaceship in Siberia, you know, and then before you know it, it's, it's, it keeps moving and it's visible from that point then. They can't, they can't, there's going to come a point perhaps where they can't hide it anymore because it's moved mm. into, into, into overland, inhabited land, you know what I mean? And the what, interesting thing, you know, northern Siberia, this was came out of the Tartarian research, um, but you, there's evidence oh, that, that that entire section of land northern siberia is decimated have you seen have you actually seen it on google maps what it looks like no it looks no. like a nuclear war has happened there oh wow it just, just, there's just craters everywhere nothing lives on that step you know what i mean well there's actually people do live there but it's a, it's a barren tundra you know they should they should move is what i'm saying <laughs> like it's <laughs> it's not worth it like just go a bit further south please but uh <laughs> the people who do live there are like ancestor spirit worship tribes, which I talk about a lot, you know, and um, they have a basic form of life. You can't, you don't just get mail there very easily. You know what I mean? It's um, they're pretty cut off from society and and in a way, but you you just look at it and you can see it's utterly destroyed. And people say, this is where this is, was Tartaria. Because you look at old maps and it used to be full of things. You know, this Northern part of Siberia used to be full of cities and kingdoms. And you see these old maps where they've drawn and painted tiny little uh, cathedrals and all sorts all all over it, churches all over it, you know, and people are saying, you know, this old ancient Tartarian civilization that lived there was destroyed suddenly in a reset event, um, a Carrington like event, you know, an electrical discharge event, which wiped everything out. And you look at the lands and yeah, sure, sure. It looks absolutely hammered. The land has just been pounded. It looks like it's had airstrikes across the entire, like, 3,000-mile expanse. You know what I mean? It's just completely bombed to hell. There's nothing there that, that is left in these craters. You know what I mean? Um, mm. And could it be that that was perhaps done immediately after the re- after the 1,000 years had ended so people wouldn't live there 
so people wouldn't be able to easily see and report what they're actually seeing when this thing comes back. You know what I mean? Was you have to th again a reinterpretation of of these events? Could it could it be it was utterly destroyed so people couldn't live there, so that people would not see the beloved city easily? Man. Just because because if that is the expanse which people will march up to to make war with it, then it kind of all adds up why that's such a decimated no man's land now. It's kind of like a barrier between us and getting closer to the camp of saints. You know what I mean? It's, it's uh, yeah, uh, it's just, again, just a thought of mine. But I remember people going on about it in the Tartarian research. So not Millennial Kingdom people. You know, these are people just talking about Tartaria. And that fits. It fits the biblical narrative of the broad expanse, you know. And that is the biggest expanse of land we have that's closest to the, the North Pole in the center. You know, that's the biggest expanse you can march up to. And it's, it's a wasteland. It's uh, I don't know, so I sort of bring that into in, into the mix here, but uh, yeah, I mean, don't, don't, don't be wrong though. The day of the Lord judgment stuff can can, can fall into this as well, and mm -hmm. I don't believe when yeah. Satan was released, it was peaceful or easy. I think he came and kicked up a huge fuss and likely caused earthquakes. We can call this the mud flood, which people go on about in Tartaria. So a lot of things got buried because of, like, because of liquefaction of the mud, things just started to sink, you know, and perhaps uh, that destruction, he he literally destroyed that entire area as soon as he got out because he knew what was coming, you know, who knows. Um, but, I mean, it says here in, in terms of the day of the Lord, if it wasn't Satan, you know, it says here in Micah 1, 4, and the mountain shall be molten under him and the valleys shall be cleft as wax before the fire. You know, um the mountains quake at him, it says in uh, Nahum 1 5, and the hills melt and the earth is burned at his presence and the world and all that dwell within. Um, so, but is, it, is it possible God brought judgment onto that area because they were living in absolute rebellion and sin against him? And God does this, he brings judgment to those who don't repent. Why would he stop doing it in the modern yeah. age suddenly? You know what I mean? And that's what Shelley was getting at. And is it possible it's utterly destroyed because God utterly destroyed that horrible place full of blasphemy and sin against the, you know, against him? That could have been it. Could it have been destroyed when Jesus came to establish his kingdom and make war? You know, because it wasn't the tribulation was him making war. You know, tribulation was him destroying his enemies. And mm -hmm. that could have been a place he destroyed <laughs> during yeah. the war. Jesus could have destroyed that entire expanse for all we know. Um, it, again, we have to, the history, we've been lied to. We don't know why the earth looks the way it does, but as things just do not make sense, especially no, they, because, when it comes to Siberia, <clears throat> especially. But anyway, just to summarize the North Pole, it, it, people think he might be there, but people also say, that's an inversion. He's actually in the South Pole, whatever that means. I can't quite square that or understand that yet exactly. But because uh, does that mean it's a globe from that perspective? Is that how you get to that? Or yeah, because Vinny, Vinny B, that Vinny B guy that you interviewed, he seems to believe that it's it's on the South, right? But I think he also doesn't think it's a round disc where there's an ice wall all the way around. I think he thinks it's square. See, and I don't know what, what it is, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. It, it could be a <laughs> yeah. circle with the inner square of some kind, because it says he gathers from the four corners of the earth. You hear yep. four corners of the earth a lot in the Bible, mm -hmm. you know, so that implies it's it's a square or a rectangle or something, you know. Yeah. And could it, could it be maybe the, you know, the, the map we get, we get shown where it is a rectangle map? That's the common one you put on a poster on your wall, you know. Could it be actually? <laughs> could it actually be something like that? And the North and South Pole is like an island to the North and to the South. Maybe, maybe it is. Some, you know, I don't. I don't really know. I, again, I don't claim to know the model. Um, I, I just know it's not what we've been told. That's all. I'm open to it being anything. I don't claim to understand God's creation fully. You know, but um, I know it's enclosed. That's all I can say. It's an enclosed right. system, and that's all I'm willing. That's as far as I'm willing to go right now, because there are too many models, too much speculation on this. Um, and from our tiny perspective, I don't think we can know until it's until we get to see it from his perspective. <laughs> you know what I mean? I wasn't there when he laid the foundations of the earth. So I can only speculate where the camp of saints is based on my limited knowledge, but it seems like everything about the North Pole is, has some kind of satanic story or inversion about the possible truth. Santa Claus is a great example. You yeah. know, um, Santa Claus is literally God. He's an omnipotent, omnipresent being that judges you whether you're naughty or nice. Only difference is he gives you stuff, physical things dependent on your good or bad karma. OK, that's not Jesus. It's an inversion of Jesus. You know, Jesus is an omnipotent, all seeing son of God who 
well, don't judgment's over. It's now salvation through faith and grace. You know what I mean? But at the same yeah. time, it's a play on that, isn't it? The you know, judgment at the end of time, you know, the final judgment for the, for the, those who utterly rejected God in that respect. <clears throat> and uh, a possibly of the, of the father, the devil, and you can get into all sorts of weeds about serpent seeds and unredeemables if possible. I don't, I don't even know if that's true. I don't want to say it's true, but uh, Santa Claus is a satanic inversion of Christ. That's it basically is. it. And it's saying, oh, Santa Claus is in the North Pole. He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows if you're good or bad, yeah. you know. And it's kind of, well, if Jesus is in, the, is in the North Pole and he is the son of God, then it's a parody on him. That's yeah. what it is. It's a, it's a satanic parody of the truth. Not only um, that, Santa Santa has elves, too. So that that's like yeah. he has his helpers. Which would be the saints. Yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a satanic inversion. Absolutely. And uh, this is this is what I mean. It kind of makes sense of a lot of weird things when yeah. you start to realize what's going on. It's it's the Wizard of Oz story. The Wizard of Oz is a satanic inversion of the pilgrimage to the North Pole to uh, to see him, which you have to do. Oh, wow. in your... so think about it. It says in it says, you know, those who don't make the yearly pilgrimage to see him will suffer drought. OK, so I do believe during his millennial reign. It was people were going up to see him regularly. They were making the pilgrimage mm -hmm. to the to the beloved city every year to show up, honor him, you know, show up, sh prove that they're on his side type of thing. And those who didn't, the nations who didn't, suffered drought. This may explain why there are such sand filled tundras everywhere, which yeah. <laughs> just seem so out of place. Maybe these are the places that did suffer the the consequences of rebellion, you know. Um, and that's where the demons dwell, it seems, in these dry places. <laughs> and perhaps, I don't know, because the Nephilim are still around and disembodied. They haven't been cast into the Lake of Fire yet during the millennial reign. That comes right at the end, you know. So there's still rebellion during his reign. People still made the choice not to follow the yellow brick road and go see the man <laughs> behind the curtain in his emerald city. It's, oh, a, wow. it's, it's, a, sa it's a satanic, wow. you know, it's a satanic inversion of the truth of what really happened. And we live in a world now that does nothing but mock the possible yeah. truth of our reality. Do you get what I mean? Everything's just a, a satanic joke now. And um, it's run by clowns. I'm, I'm not going to bring that up. I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> <laughs> what about, it's something I thought of while you were say, you know, talking about all that and the possibility that jesus and the camp of the saints could could be at the north pole um I, I just had it on my mind the whole time is um where jesus said that he would draw all men unto himself and mm -hmm. isn't it funny that the one place all of our compasses are point pointing towards we're not mm -hmm. even allowed to go we can't even go see what our compasses are pointing us towards which is, you mm -hmm. know, the, the North Pole, the magnetic North Pole. So I don't I don't know. That's that's a very, very interesting theory. And as you said a while ago, somebody brought up, you know, the theory that maybe um, the Camp of the Saints is um, in Antarctica or, you know, over just over the ice wall. Mm -hmm. um, have you have you read much of Admiral Byrd's diary? If that's true. He literally found a city, um, another civilization, and he described that city as being made of crystal, clear as clear as glass, and it didn't have any, you know, it didn't need any lights. Like the city itself was um, was emitting light, like this glorious light. And um, I don't know. That's interesting because I, I think that. Admiral Byrd described seeing this, finding this city. Um, when he crossed over, he flew over the ice wall. And I mm -hmm. think it's been a while since I have, you know, watched videos on this or read anything about it. But it said something about these orbs of light or either these UFO type objects took control of his plane and his controls. And he could no longer, you know, control where he was going. And they led him to this city. Um have you have you gone down that rabbit hole years ago i did this is the thing i i i was there when all these things were first being talked about you know when the, mainly when the flat earth was getting big 
all yeah. of Admiral Byrd stuff was all the rage then, you know, and everyone was talking about it. It's been years. I got I got my flat earth degree like I don't know, eight years ago, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> I moved on from that and, and thought about other things. I've been swimming in Nephilim history and clowns for like uh, seven of those years. So I do need, I need to go back and refresh myself on all of it, but I do remember everything you're talking about. Um yeah. Yeah. he found and he kept saying there's a there's a land yet undiscovered just south of South America, which is as large as and he goes on to explain that there's still places to discover yet. Yep. We haven't discovered everything, you know, and he's saying uh, there is this land. Um, now, where exactly he went? Did he go beyond the ice wall? I don't know. I think there's possible. it's possible that there, there were just there's land we don't know about within our enclosed system. Yeah. You know, that just, mm-hmm. just isn't on a map. And all of our commercial air, air, no, flights and boats and everything like that will never see it because you're not allowed in your paths are not your your paths are already determined Mm -hmm. you know what i mean you're not allowed to go out and deviate from your paths if you do there's usually military intervention (laughs) you know that's how it usually works there's no fly zones for a reason you know what i mean and um our world is very small i think compared to what is actually there i mean i don't know have you heard about the moon map yes i have you know and that shows that you know beyond our little circle is far more you know, and uh, the dome stretches far further than we can understand. It's not simply just over our little mapped out little place that we we call home. You know, um, who knows? Who honestly, honestly, who knows? Like, uh, and this is why I say I'm I'm not willing to to box myself in to not to, to get, I'm not trying to use a pun there, but I'm not trying to uh, <laughs> I'm not trying to limit the the scope of God's creation. That, that that isn't me saying space is real. I know that's not the case. It's an enclosed system. It's limited. It's finite. It's not infinite as we get inverted and told, you know. Um, but I do think it's a lot bigger, a lot more mysterious than we we know from our current perspective, which is why I, I said at the start, we're doing the best we can with what we've got here. Yeah. Um, but it's fun to speculate. <laughs> it sure is fun yeah. to speculate. Um, but yeah, I, I don't. I don't know. I don't know. I th- I, I lean towards personally. Uh, North Pole. That's right. what I'm leaning towards for the Camp of Saints. Yeah. What What if I can't remember um, where this was um, that Admiral Byrd, you know, found this city? Was it, mm. I mean, was it over the ice wall or, or did, because he also went to the North Pole, didn't he? Didn't he also explore up there? I kind of thought it was the North where he saw the, yeah. the mammoths and all that, but I could be wrong. Well, it matches the Smoky God story, doesn't it? Yeah, which is a, yeah. a father son who sailed north. It got really, really cold, and then suddenly it got really warm again. <laughs> and then, yeah, yeah. before they know it, they've hit an island. Which, after going through some weird caves, almost as though they went into the earth, and suddenly they're in this this place full of slightly taller humans who have a king over them, and it's this perfected place with bizarre technologies and uh, a warm glow everywhere. Their own sun. It's, it's like this is very. It's a different, you know, it, these stories are everywhere um, mm, yeah. of, of these perfected Edens in this place just beyond, you know. Um, and I, I, it's kind of like, you know, like the, have you heard of the stories of the giants in Americas? The, yeah. the, mm-hmm. gi- the, the giant um, fossils that were all discovered in the 1800s. Yes. Like in the 1800s, there's just a vast discovery of hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of giant skeletons, just digging them out of mounds, left, right, and center, all over America, across every state. And the newspapers were going wild during that time period, and they were documenting archaeologists discovers 16-foot giants here over here. Archaeologists discovers 10 bodies of, of 12-foot giants here, you know. And these are credi- incredible archaeologists of the day are the ones... Dis- oh, they're not like nobodies who are... And all the local newspapers who are involved are uh, all reporting these discoveries everywhere. But we don't have one giant skeleton to prove it. Because the Smithsonian came in and took them all. Yeah. And this is them. this is a lot. This, this is the same thing we're seeing here. You know, there's all these evidences from this ta- early, not that long ago time period where people were discovering all sorts of things that do that corroborate with biblical mythology and history, you know. But we have no evidence for it today. It's all gone. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I would have thought Admiral Byrd would have would maybe have done a sketch or two of what he saw. You know, possibly um, documented a lot more thoroughly than we than we probably see today. That's that's how it goes. You know, we only we only we've been given glimpses and butchered glimpses at that. 
of what actually happened. People are actively working against us to hide more and more. That's why all these uh, amazing architectural buildings, perhaps remnants of the millennial reign, have all mysteriously burnt down. Mm-hmm. All, all of them have great, every city has a great fire of the 1800s at some point or the late 1700s the great fire of whatever you know that's destroyed just miles upon miles of buildings and land you know and it's kind of it's shocking i mean even where i live in in this north in this city in the north of england it's a small town you know and and it's not much um but even we even we have architecture here as i described earlier which is insane huge Romanesque pillared structured buildings, extremely intricate designed, beautiful architecture just slapped in the middle of this of this tiny city, you know, this little village city thing. And I looked into the history of it and we used to have this beautiful town hall. And it was incredible. The look at this thing. It was just insane. It looked like a cathedral of 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 beautiful standards, you know what I mean? It was it was, it was incredible. And it had all the antique tech attached to it and all the Gothic architecture, as we call it, to it and everything like that. It had its own clock and everything, like Big Ben. Um, and it's gone. We don't have that today. We have the buildings surrounding it, which are of similar architecture, but the town hall is gone. And I looked into it and surprise, surprise, fire, burnt down. Mysterious mm. fire in the middle of the night, out of nowhere, utterly destroyed. Gone. This beautiful piece of of architecture. We have photos and remnants of it, but it got burnt down in the forties, nineteen forties. Yeah, I had heard uh, from a documentary one time too that do you do you think that part of World War One and World War Two was to destroy a lot of all of this too? Because I know that that was that kind of yeah. happened back then too. Absolutely. Well, World War One was a rise of empires. It was it was all the empires fighting each other in Europe specifically. Um, it seems like Europe is like a center point for a lot of these this architectural style it seems like it was a, a central hub of some kind i'm not trying to get all uh european israelite on you about this i'm really not you know that's not what i'm saying but it seems like it was it was definitely some kind of hub for a lot of this architecture um and a lot of it was destroyed in the early 20th century world war one and world war ii um mm-hmm. yeah, it was just just utter destruction of everything there's plenty of photos of that, of just how vast the destruction was through carpet bombings and air raids and tanks and everything else, you know. And I was thinking about this the other day, actually, and, and I suppose I'm going to keep this in the modern age now and talk about it in a way maybe listeners can relate to. But I used to be an avid video game gamer. Um, I used to love my first-person shooters. You know, I don't play it anymore. And since having a child, I haven't touched the thing in like three years. You know, I just don't have time for that. Uh, I've left it all behind. But I used to play a lot of Battlefield and uh, Battlefield 1 was a game that came out, maybe about, I think it was came out in maybe 2016 or something like that. And, you know, what struck me most about the game is the beautiful architecture in the cities that the game is based in. Um, and literally the whole game is you destroying all the architecture as you fight one another. And, you know, the buildings have this amazing, the technology of the day, you know, have this amazing destructive effect to them. Everything can be destroyed and crumble as you attack it with things and missiles and whatever, you know. Things just start, by the end of the game, the map is destroyed. All the buildings have been decimated, you know what I mean? Just through the sheer chaos of, of, of the destruction that your weaponry has caused. And I didn't realize until now, I may have to go back and it with new eyes, but a lot of the architecture you're destroying is is what could be considered millennial kingdom Tartarian architecture. And it's as though that game is telling you the truth in a subtle way. You know what I mean? Like so much beauty, beauty was destroyed in this war. Like one of the maps you fight on online is literally a, like a, um, Versailles, for example, everyone always talks about that, that mansion, um, with the fountains in the Tartarian, you know, um, buildings like that you're destroying is where, where it's set, you know what I mean? With this beautiful pillared architecture, cathedral style everywhere, like huge courts with fountains and pillars and statues of angels everywhere and all this sort of thing. And it's like a stately home of some kind in France, in the middle of France or something. And you just you just decimate it. 
that's what you do. That's what the game is. You know, you're killing each other for points, but in the process, you're utterly destroying the remnants of the Millennial Kingdom, perhaps, in this game. And it's like they went out of the way to focus on that aspect of the game, you know, and you spend a lot of it in France, you know, and on in uh, go to um, Russia as well because of the communist Bolshevik revolution that happened during that time period, fighting against the empire, the Russian empire, you know, and the kingdom. Um, and one of those battles takes place in this gorgeous Orthodox cathedral and you just destroy the thing. <laughs> you know, that's all you do. And you flatten it and make it no longer exist anymore. And by the end of the, by the end of the 30 minute round, you know, and it's one of those things you don't notice the details of the game. Cause you're just focused on trying to survive and shoot other people. <laughs> but when you're actually, now I look at it with new eyes, I realize I think that game was, was literally like a joke. It was, they were like, it's like the laughing at us. You know, like uh, they're telling you what happened, and uh, you find that's what a lot of media does. I mean, just on the same topic, while we're talking about messages in media, the Truman Show, for example, everyone always thought that was a flat Earth analogy. You know, but mm. I think it's more of a false history, a false narrative analogy. Mm. Everything's a show. Everything's orchestrated by the media in that world. You know, everything that yeah. Truman sees is put in put in. It's controlled by one, well, it's one person in the film, but it's a media team, isn't it? A team, a conspiracy, let's say. Mm -hmm. And I believe a lot of the events we're going to see unfold are contrived, scripted events to try and make it look like Revelation is coming to pass. And everything in Truman's life was a contrived, scripted event to sell products or something or to create drama that isn't real. I think it was telling us that clearly that that's kind of how it's all going to unfold within an enclosed system of forces. <laughs> you know? And I think, again, this, this just lines in what I said at the start. We have to now start to reconsider everything again, conspiracy related with, with this new lens. So I think we're going to start seeing things we didn't see before. Oh yeah. yeah. I, yeah, I agree. And I was, I was telling my wife this the other day uh, because I was telling her about, you know, the geological locations might not be where they are. And she said, well, what about that one guy that found all those chariot wheels and stuff in the Red Sea and stuff? And I said, honestly, I don't I don't know. I said he I don't know who that guy is. He could very well be an actor. You know, Ron Wyatt is who I'm speaking of. Hmm. And I said, we could very possibly just be living on a stage, just kind of like what you're saying, where it's just everything is just. Uh, forcing you to kind of believe the narrative that we're being fed. And so it, it like, it buries you even further down deeper into all the uh, propaganda. Mm -hmm. So I believe, well, you look at the, the nature of, of secret societies, that's a big thing in the conspiracy. The Freemasons control everything. The Shriners control everything. You know what I mean? It's, it's the Jesuits, it's the Rosicrucians, you know, it's these Power 13, uh, Illuminati blood fam, uh, bloodline families, you know what I mean? It's, it's the Rothschilds, it's the Rockefellers. And when you actually start to look into the, the older history of these, of these societies, go back to the 1800s or 1700s, uh, one group really stood out to me is the Oddfellows. And these were really the ones that, again, took control of, of the post-millennial kingdom, shall we say, season. They were, the, they were the ones who took the orphans under their wings and they presented themselves to the public as a charitable organization there to look after the children. To the attitude, you know, um, by the power of God, which God, I, I know they don't make that clear, but I think we know who it really is um, because they were aligned they clearly the secret sites are clearly aligned with the luciferian doctrine they make no secret of it actually albert pike confessed this himself you know and he was a member of the odd fellows albert pike he was also a high level freemason who wrote morals and dogma which was the roadmap for freemasonry but you look at the odd fellows and you realize the role presidents and prime ministers very 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 high up people in governments you know what i mean they're all members of the odd fellows give or take maybe not all but a lot of them were, but also in the mix with these presidents and high end judges, statesmen, governors, you know, all these these powerful, influential people are actors. Um, yeah. Charlie Chaplin, you know what I mean, for example. And there's a lot of them. I can't name them all. There's a lot of just comedians and actors thrown in there. P.T. Barnum was a member. He was the greatest showman who invented the three ring circus. Rings is the logo of the 
So they've been incorporating it into everything. They've always controlled the media, including all forms of early entertainment during that age, like circuses, for example, which was the first proto form of entertainment for that. They've always had the foot in, but why are why are high end leaders and officials who dictate and control the narrative of culture, leaders of countries, mingling with actors? And I do wonder if the Odd Fellows was literally like a branch of the overarching group of secret societies. It was just one of them, where the actors who play roles on the world stage are members which means that those playing the role of the current president, let's say, are merely just an actor playing that role on the stage of reality. And they're a member of this fraternity who's writing these scripts on behalf of their master, which would be Satan in the little season. You know, it just seems bizarre when you realize that oh, why, why, why are these members like they're so unrelated to each other, you know, leaders of countries and small time actors of movie stars. But <laughs> The same are the all actors. Is the odd fellows just the guild for the performer? Get to play characters on the real stage called um, the mainstream narrative. <laughs> you know what I mean? Are they are they the ones who play those roles? We all know crisis actors exist. Yeah, so we probably, probably can't talk about that, you know. But it, we all know it can drive events to make it seem like things are happening that aren't really happening, and that probably includes these people who are just currently playing the role of the president of the United States, <laughs> you know, and they have a script. Um, yep. and, and again, they're all in, they're all in the club that have been the secret society and they've had that. And if people theorize again, you know, we talked earlier about the Freemasons. They're the ones who basically moved into all that was everywhere at the end of the millennial kingdom and claimed they built it. You know, we were the, <laughs> it were the mates, the stone masons who built all these buildings everywhere. And we have the Shriners, which were an offshoot of Freemasonry with a Middle Eastern Islamic theme. And it just seems so bizarre. The backstory for why they exist is so stupid. It's a member of Freemason of Freemasonry went to a party one night which had an Arabian theme and he just loved it so much he decided to invent a secret society with all the similar symbolism. For, uh, <laughs> for, just for fun one night. Okay. Right? And now the Shriners, you know, have hospitals like over like 200 hospitals in America alone where they, they minister to the sick, dying children, of course, for free. So they're a charitable, loving organization. But all of their shrines are in these temples, which are incredible Moorish Islamic design with onion domes and all these type of things. And they claim they built all these clearly complex temples you know which, which were built by a culture that is not shriners you know, you know what I mean? and it's kind of like they're just there to create a story to why these buildings exist that's what the freemasons and the shriners are there for and it's like oh yeah the reason you see these islamic temples as we call them today in america is because the shriners built them for, because they liked the theme and the style for their little club but what if these buildings were already here and this needed a story to explain them like they don't fit the theme of America, they shouldn't be there <laughs> by the dictation of history of where these buildings from by a mainstream narrative from English culture and European culture. They shouldn't exist. Why is there Moorish Middle Eastern architecture in the lands of America? You know what I mean. So to come up with a story, they have these secret societies just inventing stuff, just making stuff up, claiming ownership of it, and claiming they built it, establishing things, founding things. You know, and changing the dates on, on inscriptions on rocks and stone to, to match the, their own version of the story. It seems like a lot of that was going on. And that's what these secret societies are for. They're, they're just people who have aligned themselves with Satan during his little season. And they get to benefit from it. They get power. They get influence. They get free real estate, mansions to live in for free. You know what I mean? They get all sorts of benefits by siding with the devil during this time. And that seems to be what they are. They're actually just sellouts for their own kind it's the best way to describe them, you know. Um, I just, I just thought anyway, I've rambled on a bit there, but I thought that was also an interesting angle, which doesn't get discussed as much. Oh yeah, yeah, hundred yeah, um, percent. Hey, so about the the buildings and stuff. There's a lot of people that think that these weren't really like dwelling places in a sense, but I mean, they they might have been, but some people are speculating that they were like energy harnessing 
facilities. Have you heard anything like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A cathedral is just a play on the word cathode, which is an energy cathode, right? Which is an yeah. energy storing device, you know. And it's possible what we call a cathedral actually had more parts to it at one point, <laughs> and it's missing. Yeah, they parts. they took them yeah. out. Yeah, it's like a giant machine of some kind, which was used basically to power the entire area within, like, I don't know, a fifty mile radius or something like that, by harnessing energy through its spires from the ether. Yes, it seems like a lot of these buildings seem to have practical uses to their geometry and spires and and the way they're shaped and designed. Um, mm -hmm. If you zoom out, it looks like a circuit board. Most city. I, yeah. I saw that. I saw that. That's yeah. very interesting. And it's like, it, just, it, it seems too perfectly laid out to yeah, just be a coincidence. Do you know, like the classic um, pillared rectangle building everywhere? It's Parthenon, you would call it, like a Greek style Parthenon. It's a rectangle, cube, like a, um, a cube. What do you call it? Why, why can't I, is it a cuboid? A cuboid. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, a, lo a long 3D rectangle. Um, with just pillars going all the way around and then it's got like a, a, a pyramid roof on each end that goes across and it's basically like just a solid block and to us it looks like a grand piece of architecture but when you actually zoom out a bit and look at it within the city it looks like a, a stereotypical black microchip with all its prongs sticking out the side that you stick into a microchip you end onto a, a, a board of some kind you know it was like a, a super advanced but you could describe it as primitive because it's using stone <laughs> But a super advanced way of of controlling the flow of energy. It's like a lot of these buildings were designed for that reason, working with frequency vibration and geometrical forms which mimic those ethereal vibrations in order to channel them correctly. And it's like it was a global a global, I keep using that word, I'm sorry. It's like it was no, a, it's like it was a you know, this this earth wide power grid. Probably likely linked to ley lines and all that gets involved as well. But um it seems like during the millennial reign, it was powered free energy. You know, it was free energy everywhere. Everything was just glowing. Everything was, it was a beautiful time to be alive. It looked incredible, you know, and a lot of it was done through, you know, Tesla arc type stuff, <laughs> like electricity that can't damage you, but can power everything type stuff. You know, uh, I think, I think to live through that time, and to actually truly see it in its full glory without all the buildings that have been destroyed, you know, with them still being there. Um, I don't think we can comprehend what it looked like. I really don't. And, you know, it says, you know, in my father's house, there's many rooms, you know, and he prepares yeah. a place for you. Um, that seems to describe this kingdom that had these buildings with multiple rooms and building. And it's like, who's filling these rooms in these giant estates and these mansions that are built you know these stately homes and things like this it's kind of they, they look they look insane yeah. and it's, it looked like they actually had a practical purpose beyond simply sleeping in them you know and it's possible like um i think i was describing it, it was in uh, a vision in daniel 7 i was describing it yesterday um on the live show and uh, maybe i should get it up and read it but i speculated about who built these things and this is just something i'm throwing out there um because we're talking about the buildings right now obviously and it's just something i'm thinking and may, perhaps these a lot of these buildings weren't actually built during the millennial reign okay so this is uh, this is we're working with speculation here and i think this is something definitely worth talking about so let me just get daniel seven up here so i can read it see i don't want to miss a trick here but it seems like there was a i think i had three points i took from daniel seven's vi uh, the vision daniel had of a future time and um he even gives you the interpretation of his dream. Um, and it says here, it seems like he's describing tribula both tribulation, the millennial reign, and the, and the little season. That's what Daniel's dream is showing him here. Okay. Wow. In metaphor is what I've kind of reinterpreted this as. So it says here, you know, Daniel spake and said, I saw a vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven strove upon the great sea. And four great beasts came out of the sea, diverse from one another. The first was like a lion that had eagle's wings. So that seems to me like Britain and America, which came together. You know, a lion is Britain and America is eagle wings. So that seems like it's talking about America there. Um, wow. I, I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man. And a man's heart was given to it. So it seems like this kingdom rose and everything was taken away from it. 
Then it says here, behold, another beast, a second, like a bear, and it raised itself up on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it, and they thus, and they said thus to it, arise, devour much flesh. After this I beheld, and lo, another, like a leopard, which had upon its back its four wings of a fowl, and the beast that had four heads, the dominion was given to it. So it's talking about three kingdoms rise during some time out of the sea, out of the people. Okay. And then it says here, this is interesting, let's talk about the fourth one. So after this, in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth, it devoured, breaking in pieces, and stamped the residue and the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts and were before it, that were before it, and it had ten horns. So this thing had iron teeth right and it was it was unlike the other three thing the other three beasts the other three kingdoms this is describing some kind of future kingdom that would come after the, those three which would be far beyond the other three before it was way more diverse and insane it doesn't even attribute an animal to describing this particular beast just that it was strong exceedingly and had teeth like iron i think this might be describing the little season now I think it, three, king, three beasts rise and have everything taken away from them. And then after that, there's this other kingdom that suddenly rises, which is far beyond all those. I think now this is, this is a little season now in Daniel 7 7. I think this is my theory, okay? Because it says here, I considered the horns, and behold, where came upon them a little horn, before whom there was three in the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn, there were eyes like the eyes of a man and the mouth speaking great things. So this sounds like an Antichrist figure. Right. So this could be talking about a pre-tribulation event or a kingdom that rose up and then is suddenly cut. Sh this is the fourth kingdom, which I think comes after the millennial kingdom again. It's because this is what I think happens. So Satan is this fourth the leader of this fourth beast. Okay. Satan tries to establish his kingdom. Then tribulation and everything gets taken away from him. But then once he's released after a thousand years, he tries to reestablish once before. Okay, so... Yeah, that makes that makes perfect yeah, sense. Yeah, so we're talking yeah. about this This fourth beast was before and after the thousand years. Okay, so you have to think about it like, mm. while I'm describing it here. I beheld till the thrones were cast down and the Ancient of, of Days did sit. So Ancients of Days, I think that's God. I think they're talking about uh, Yahweh there, aren't they? They're talking about... Yeshua, you know, the the ancient of days, the oldest thing since the creation of time, you know, did sit on the throne whose garments was white as snow and the hair of his head as pure as wool. And his throne was like a fiery flame and his wheels as burning fire. So that's God on his throne. He's describing the wheels of God there and his God's throne, isn't it? You know, um, a fiery stream issued and came forth from him. Thousands, thousands ministered unto him, unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him, and the judgment was set, and the books were opened. So he's having a vision here of the great white throne judgment at the end of time as well. So he's talking right. about the little season come, getting cut short here. Man. Okay, so he hasn't mentioned the thousand year reign yet, though. All it's talked about is so that these kingdoms rise up one, two, three, four. The fourth one is crazy, and then bam judgment it all gets cut down and judgment comes then so that's like a shortened condensed version of the entire story of tribulation through to great white throne judgment without mentioning the millennial kingdom yet but then he mentions the millennial kingdom it's like he he retells the story but adds the millennial kingdom in now okay so he says the hell then became a voice of the great words which the horn spake so he's talking about the uh, the antichrist here in the beast isn't he the one that during tribulate just before tribulation um and I beheld till the beast was slain. So this, this, so this is talking about tribulation. You know, the Antichrist comes speaking great blasphemies, and then bam, it gets cut short. The beast was slain, and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. So you know, the beast and the false prophet get thrown into the lake of fire, don't they? Um, and it says here, I saw the the night vision, and behold, one like the son of man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the ancient of days. And they brought him near before him. So here is talking about the Son of Man, Jesus, coming down in the clouds of heaven with his kingdom. And there was given him dominion and glory 
and a kingdom, and all people, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, and which shall not be destroyed. He even says in Revelation, when they surround the great white throne, sorry, when they surround the camp of saints, it's still there, it's not been destroyed. Everything surrounding it gets destroyed. So even when that fire comes down, it still doesn't get destroyed. Only all the enemies that came against it in Revelation. So this is talking about his everlasting physical kingdom on earth. Okay, so he's not talking about New Jerusalem <coughs> on earth yet. This is talking about four empires rise. Then the fourth one is greater than all the rest. And he tries to speak blasphemies and great words. Tribulation happens and then Jesus comes in his kingdom. That's, what it, that's basically what it's condensed and shortened down there. But it's also explaining that this fourth beast comes after the kingdom as well. It's both wow. sides. It's, both, it's at both ends of the millennial reign. So the millennial reign gets, uh, gets mentioned here in Daniel 7. It says, I, Daniel, grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body, and the vision of my head troubled me. I came near unto them and stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made me know the interpretation of things. So he gets told what this means now. Okay, and it says here, the th the th these great beasts, which are four, are four kings, which shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, ever, forever, and ever. And then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron <coughs> and nails were of brass, iron and brass. Aren't bullets made of brass tips? Is that is that true? Is that what they're made of? Is it is it copper? I'm not sure what you make. What you make bullets yeah, I think out it's of? Brass. It's brass, isn't it? Yeah, and obviously the yeah. teeth were of iron. So we're talking about machinery here. We're talking about the modern age. This is talking about our age, where we have bullets and where we have everything made of iron and metal. Everything we build is made of metal now, and we have weapons, nails. Nails like claws, things you use to attack people with, of brass, you know. I think this fourth kingdom's talking about the little season kingdom. It's talking about us now, which devoured, broke in pieces, and stamped the residue with his feet. That's that's describing the, the wars we just talked about, which destroyed everything, destroyed all the evidences of the kingdom. And uh, it seems like he's remaking some kind of tribulation event with these... <coughs> These 10 leaders within maybe t nations go to war with each other and put on a show. And there's like another you know, Antichrist figure who starts speaking. And you know, the horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. So this is talking about a time where this is tribulation. This is, this is again, the Antichrist making war with the saints, beheading the saints, winning against them. And then suddenly the ancients of days came. So Jesus comes and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And the time came and the saints possessed the kingdom. So keep saying here, the saints get persecuted, but then they get given the kingdom. What kingdom exactly? I don't think this is talking about Jesus' kingdom. I think this is talking about the kingdoms these four kings created. So it's saying here, four kings, four nations rose up. They built something amazing. One of them was incredibly diverse. The fourth one was the most diverse. Then it was cut short and the saints were given it. They were given that kingdom that was built. So I think Daniel 7 is telling us here, perhaps, that all these millennial kingdom buildings, so-called, all these Tartarian buildings, so-called, were built by these four heathen nations just before tribulation. And then once tribulation happened, Jesus gave it all to the saints and then they were repurposed it's not that the buildings were utterly destroyed and that's not all of them what, what was left after tribulation was given to the saints it seems because he came that time that the saints possessed the kingdom thus he said the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth which shall be diverse from all kingdoms and shall devour the earth and shall tread it down and break it in pieces okay now this is where it gets even more trippy so there he's saying you know this fourth beast this final kingdom it's probably the little season kingdom, the last kingdom. And it will devour the whole earth, tread it down, destroy buildings, re get rid of everything once it comes back. And it says yeah. here, this is, a, this is an interesting one. It shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given unto his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. 
So at some point, this final kingdom, this final beast, will change time. And we don't even know today. We're questioning what time we're actually in. Our timeline's been messed up. People have tried to equate this to the Mandela effect, this quote. It's the changing yeah. of time, you know. But what if he's actually saying, no, he, he just rewrote history. You don't know what time you live in anymore. He's changed all the laws. All the laws of God have been inverted. Um, the laws of physics have been made up and lied about, about the reality of the universe and nature and reality. He's utterly turned everything on its head. And we're living in that time now, you know. And again, Absolutely. I think we have to reinterpret this vision from Daniel. He wasn't just talking about tribulation. Right. I think he was talking about our civilization post-tribulation. I think it'd be because this is a dream vision. It's all over yeah. the place. Even he's like, I don't fully understand what I'm looking at here. It's all metaphorical, yeah. mashed together symbology. But from the description of this, it literally says four kingdoms rise up. And they create these things. And one of them is an incredibly diverse kingdom. Diversity today is something that is obsessive about. Our culture is all about creating diversity. You know, and is that a reference to this kingdom? Is that the point of it? Is that why we're always, that's always thrown in our face? We're living in this diverse <laughs> kingdom right now. Wow. And you know, when it was first destroyed, the saints were given all the buildings. So could these buildings have been built by bad people initially maybe they're not of god this is just a theory again to try and understand the history of all of this because again daniel 7 says the saints were given buildings they were given this kingdom and i don't think they were talking about jesus's kingdom from that came down from heaven that's jesus's kingdom that's his kingdom you know that's that's his beloved city maybe they were given the camp of saints and maybe it was these buildings i don't know but um i'll explain why the saint iconography all over these cathedrals you know, um, maybe they were already there. Maybe these ancient cultures that rose up were using this type of tech already. We don't know what type of world was around in these ancient times, truly, you know. But once um, it was it was taken off of them, is what I'm saying here. Like, it's like these, these, because this is an interesting one. It says here in Daniel 12, this is, this is kind of like a, a bit of a smoking gun verse here. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and time. That's Daniel seven twelve. What does that mm. What does that mean? The rest of the beasts had their dominion taken away, given to the saints, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. So this is explaining here. They had to live through the millennial reign after losing their kingdom that they built. It was taken off of them, given to the saints by Jesus, and they lived through with prolonged lives through the millennial reign. Because that's the time period where we're told people will live longer. Right. Okay, so these kings who built these beast cities that Daniel envisioned lost it all, and they had to watch as their buildings and their kingdoms were handed over to the resurrected saints. And then they had to live through it probably in rebellion, being ruled by Jesus with a rod of iron, as it's described, you know. And is it possible, once the millennial reign ended, these people who had to live through it took control of their old kingdom again? Interesting. And that's Very what we're living in. You know, that's what happened. They, they, they waited for Satan to be released, sided mm -hmm. with him, and then took back the kingdom that was taken from them after tribulation. Wow. I think that's... Because that verse, Daniel 7, 12, kind of says it. It says it right there. You know, concerning Yeah, I'm going to have to revisit that. Yeah, Daniel yeah. 7. Just, re just read it with new eyes. The whole It's only short. It's only like 20, 25, uh, 28 uh, verses. But just... <sighs> yeah, that one, that one got me when I read that one. As concerning the rest of the beast, they had their dominion taken away. Yet their lives were prolonged for a short season and time. Hmm. And wow. behold, the Son of Man came in the clouds of heaven. You know, and brought it. That's insane. Like, they were given him dominion and glory in the kingdom, and all the people, nations, and languages would serve him. So they had to then serve him once Jesus came. You know, yeah. or yeah. you get, or you get droughts and you get punished. But these, people, <laughs> but these people, I doubt they forgot. I doubt, doubt they were truly on his side. I think there's always been rebellion, even when Jesus is right there in front of them. People denied him. Mm -hmm. That's the story of Jesus. You know, 
even when he ruled physically on earth in a kingdom that came down from heaven, there were still people around who rebelled against him and could not wait for his kingdom to end. You know, he had enemies still. And I think those enemies reclaimed their kingdom after he left. And uh, that's what these buildings are. Those are the Freemasons moving back in. You know what I mean? That's uh, that's what's <laughs> going on here. And you, know, you, you we laugh and joke about it, but you know, there's that there's that old conspiracy, isn't there? That um, these actors don't seem to be aging; they're immortal. Right. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe that's true. Maybe they are remnants of the of the, the little of um, the millennial reign. Yeah. But they are, but they're not on Jesus' side. But they now have longevity and live for a long time because they lived during that time. Maybe that's what's oh. happened. You know what I mean? Who knows? Who knows? Like everything's like up for interpretation. But Daniel's vision there does say clearly um, they lived through it. Yeah. You know. So I don't know. I just thought to share that with you. That's I think that's uh, that's scripture backing this whole thing up again. You know, and it's uh, I'm not trying to reinterpret anything or you know throw out oh. other people's interpretations out the window. But um, I just, yeah. I just thought I just thought it was an interesting passage. Sorry, guys. Go ahead. <laughs> Absolutely. That is that is very interesting. Like I said, I'm going to have to revisit that for sure and just yeah. read it like we've been telling everyone. We, we really have to just read scripture with a fresh set of eyes, like mm -hmm. take everything out that you've been programmed to believe. This verse means that this verse means that and just read it like a child and just yeah. believe it. Don't don't have any preconceived notions or biases and then just see what it says. And I think I think that's that's the best advice that we can give anyone right now, for sure. Yeah, because yeah. the thing is, you, you would always read these passages in the past, and there'd be there'd be verses like this one that says, "Oh, they had their dominion taken away, and the lives were prolonged for a season at a time." And you don't really know what that means. You just move on and forget about it. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> you, you wouldn't take it on board. Because and the, there, there, there are always verses like this that appear when you read scripture, which don't make sense. It's like, I don't know what that means. What does it mean that their lives were prolonged for a season and time? Like, let's just go on to the next verse and forget about that. It must be something to do with tribulation, like whatever. You know, you just let's just move on. And that's kind of, but now when you, when you do read these again in, in the light of the millennial kingdom idea, suddenly that makes perfect sense why that's there. Because there will be a time where people's lives are prolonged. And there will be a time where Jesus takes away people's dominion and he rules over them physically on earth. And this, again, this spits in the face of the uh, amillennialists who believe it's all spiritual. There's no physical kingdom, you know. Right. Um, that's not what the book says. Right. It, it's it's real. It says right here, Daniel says, there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations and languages should serve him. Okay. Like, wow. that's, it's physical stuff. Yeah. Like It's talking about real things, you know. Um, and they have to go see him. It's, 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 you, know, you have to make a pilgrimage. You have to go there or else you get drought. That's a physical problem. <laughs> that's, a, that's an earthly problem. You know what I mean? And it's kind of, it doesn't, the, the Bible does not talk about, um, it's not all spiritual. It's, it's, the physical existence is a spiritual existence. It's goes yeah. hand in hand. You can't just deny one or the other, you know? Um, and I, again, I'm, I'm rambling. I'm rambling, guys. I'm sorry. About that. Uh, oh, no, yeah. no worries. Hey, so would you be interested in coming on uh, for a part two? I'd like to have you on again. Yeah. Uh, this has been a great conversation. Uh, we're pushing a little past two hours now. But um, would you be interested in coming back on and just talking about your book and and just the research that you've done and, and just all the ancient cultures with the the nephilim and the clowns and and stuff like that i can always talk about the clowns absolutely yeah. oh yeah 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 i mean we that was a new concept that got brought up to me as well when i came across you and when i first when i first looked at it i thought uh, oh, i don't know about this guy and then i started watching your videos and i was thinking i think he's on to something so yeah I, i'd love to have you back on if, if you'd be willing and we could talk about that stuff too. Yeah. Absolutely. Like I said, I know I, I've only just dipped my toes into the millennial kingdom thing, but I've spent the, the better part of my uh, conspiracy career focusing on the Nephilim and the clowns. So yes, we can have definitely have a conversation about that. I'd, I'd love to share that with you guys. And believe me, I know what it sounds like on the surface, but it, it's, it goes way deeper than you can imagine. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Did you have something to say, Shane? Oh uh, yeah, just real quick. Um, Paul, um, man, it's been it's been an honor and a privilege to have you on our show, man. This is this is really good stuff, and I'm glad there's people like you out there that's got the willingness and has been able to come out of you know your programming and your indoctrination and look at things with fresh eyes and re-examine the scriptures and you know look at it from a different perspective or a different lens than the one we've been given and um man it's it's been a great episode and i really would like to have you have you come on again and um i i've enjoyed it and uh, thank, Ricardo, thank you. i'm gonna i'm gonna hand over you know hand it over to you and let you close out because i gotta get going all right sounds good but yeah we'll we'll uh, be in contact we'll have you back on and like we always like to tell our listeners to remember to question the narrative so question everything guys but paul it's been an honor and we will uh, be in touch and god bless thanks for having me god bless all right you too. all right bye-bye